I want to do another episode like we did with the Antikythera thing. You mean the thing where we both study something and then we have a very deep conversation about our different side of it? I go the technical route, you go the humanities route? Yes, we pick something from the shaded area of the Venn diagram of our specialties and then we teach each other. I'm pretty sure you have a degree with an emphasis in military tactics. Is that correct? Yeah, something like that. Uh, I don't know. I don't think emphases are real things. I think it's something you say afterwards. But yeah, I took classes in military tactics and I have a degree in history. Well, a couple of them. So yeah, that counts. Yeah, I'm some kind of expert. Let's go with that. Sweet. And I'm pretty sure you've shot missiles at stuff and tried to think of how to defend against missiles and how to bust bunkers and things like that. That sounds pretty CG. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually studied cannons. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Let's talk about sieges today. Game on. Okay, let's start here. How does a siege happen, and I guess why does it happen? Huh. That is a good place to start. And that is not an easy question. I mean, no, let's back it up even one step further. Question for you, what is a siege? Well, a siege is, in my mind, a siege is when you've got one person that's dug in or one group of people that's dug in, uh, usually in a defensive role, and then you have these other people that are trying to get into their fortifications or into their position to take over. And so you've got an, an offensive force and a defensive force, and they're at opposition. It's like they're at this stalemate, and they basically have to figure out who's going to win, and it's a long, drawn-out process. Yeah, so I agree. I think it... I think what separates a siege from a regular battle would be that regular battles are usually much, much quicker because everybody's willing to fight because they either have to or because they both think they're going to win. So they just duke it out and get it over with. And I think the other thing that separates it is a siege is usually a desperation move to say the only play we've got is to depend on this thing we built and the provisions we have to basically die slower than the people who want to kill us. And another thing is, usually it's not something that they built, it's the generation that preceded them, or either the fortifications that they overtook, or something like that. So, yeah. often they've inherited this big fortress or something like that, right? Uh, often. I can think of quite a few exceptions, including one that I want to tell you about, where fortifications were built overnight to ward really? off some Vikings. Yeah. That's awesome. So how are we how are we going to do this? Like I don't know. I've, I've researched the weapons and the defenses and I'm assuming you've researched specific moments in history where sieges happen? Is that what you Yeah, uh, I've put some thought into the psychology and strategy of it and some specific examples. But I got to admit man, my notes they're non-existent. I don't have anything open in front of me. So I think my best course of action is just kind of the storytelling approach. So I'll do my best. Well, let me ask you, how did you research this episode? Like, we d we decided we were going to talk about sieges, and then we both went away and did research. What were your sources? Okay, source number one would be just this is my discipline, and so I think about it a lot and have read about it a lot for a long time. Source number two would be I went and grabbed uh, an audiobook and powered through it, and I don't have it in front of me, but we'll put it in the show notes because it was pretty good and pretty fast. And that was mostly about medieval siege warfare. And I read a whole bunch of articles and, oh, and you, you linked me to that podcast, Jaws of Defeat. Yeah, you can't steal one of my sources, dude. You can't do that. I know, I didn't. I didn't even listen to it. <laughs> Which one was it? I don't even, podcasts are stupid. How did you prepare? So what I did is, uh, first of all, I spent 15 years working on weapons and countermeasures. So I'm really glad you one. started the same way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, number two, uh, I visited a lot of fortresses over the years. Uh, Civil War era fortresses, uh, stuff from around the 15, 1600s in Europe. I visited some of those. And of course, like everybody goes to castles when they go to Europe, right? So yeah. you know, places like that. I did listen to Jaws of Defeat, this podcast that I found. I don't think they have many listeners, but it was a really good podcast. So I listened to a couple of episodes of that. And then I read a lot about weaponry, mostly from the World War I era, which is not a period of time that I know a lot about in terms of weapons. And then there was this time recently that I went and shot Civil War cannons with a bunch of old guys in the hills of Tennessee. <laughs> that was awesome. So I feel prepared. I really like the way we both in our subtle way tried to um, preempt the internet by being like, well, 
I guess the first thing would be my career and experience <laughs> that I'd like to cite as a source. It sounds kind of egotistical, doesn't but, it? But, it not- but honestly, this is a perfect topic for us because these are our disciplines. This is what we do. And I think it's fair to list that. And every time you go to a fort, do you think these thoughts? Every time you oh. look at a castle or whatever? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. See, me too. And in the last five weeks, I've been to a Civil War fort. I, I went to Fort Monroe in Virginia, called you from there and said we should do this episode. Yep. I went to Accra or Akko, a medieval and Turkish fort. And then I went to Masada, where there was a siege we're going to talk about in here. Jerusalem has been sieged like four times. I was there sizing that up. Just went past and only got a little bit of a look at it, but Fort Ticonderoga today, which is again in that same kind of class of fort. So I do the same thing. Anytime I go and look at these things, I'm not in tourist mode. I'm in, oh, how would this work? How many people could you garrison in here? How would you supply these people during a siege? So antenna up for a long time is a fair source to cite, right? Yeah, exactly. Cool. I think we start with how a siege happens, man. I mean, you've got the degree and whatever, all the classes in this stuff. So, I mean, am I correct in saying basically you have two forces that meet in one location and one has a better defensive position than the other and the other one basically encircles them. That's kind of how a siege happens, right? Yeah, so let's start with the simplest version and then understand that there's a whole lot that does not fit this pattern historically. What do you mean? Sieges are weird, dude. Like like the whole thing, I said it earlier, the whole goal is to die slower than your opponent. If you can die slower inside the walls, you're going to win. If you can die slower outside, you're going to win. And so... It's deliberate desperation time. People on the outside of the wall, they're an open loop system. They can bring Uh, in sources from the outside. You'd think. But people on the inside of the fortress or whatever it is, they're a closed loop system and they have to sustain. Uh, You'd think. You'd think. And so that's why I say your initial description of a siege is basically how it works. You've got usually a meaningful fortification at the very minimum, some kind of stockade. If there aren't walls, a siege won't usually last very long. So I wouldn't count like the trench warfare of World War I as a classic siege scenario. It's kind of both sides playing offense and defense at the same time. There has to be some kind of fortification and you can't go anywhere. And usually that fortification will give you, the defender, an advantage in that anyone who's attacking is wildly exposed to projectiles, to things that you can just drop off of the walls, to having to work through like a labyrinthine gate system where only one dude at a time can get through, which just makes it into a death hallway. And so the idea there is that the people inside are making it really undesirable for the people outside to finish them off. The people outside are trying to size up this location and figure out what the weak spot is and doing crazy crap to try to crack each one of these individual nuts. And the crazy crap is what introduces so much variety historically into sieges. The most nuts military stories in history are all about sieges. Oh yeah, it's it's re- it's really really cool stuff. I would I would push back with you on the trench warfare thing though because if you have a group of people that you've encircled and they have any sort of fortification, whether it be trenches or walls or whatever it is, As long as you have them cut off from the outside world, at that point, you're under siege. You're waiting for them to run out of food or ammo. Yes-ish. But part of the deal, too, is that oftentimes people who built these fortifications thought in advance about what it would look like to get people out during a siege. So a lot of times you could leave if you wanted to. But you know that if you leave, that controlling location that has such a great sphere of influence is gone forever. You're never taking it back. And so there's a reluctance to leave on the part of defenders, even when they theoretically could get out of there and save their own lives. But wouldn't you just burn your own castle down or destroy all the whatever makes where you're at important and then leave? The same as scuttling a boat? That's a great question. Okay, let me throw this out. What's the most strategic location you've ever been at? Just traveling around, you're like, oh my goodness, I see why they put that there. I've been to the Eagle's Nest in Germany, Birch's Garden. I have not. What's it like? I've actually been there twice. I did a sound traveler from there. It's very, very high, obviously. It's amazing. So the cool thing about that area, 
is they still use it strategically today, like not far away from where, for those of you that don't know, the Eagle's Nest is where Hitler's bunker was, where he would retreat at the very end. There's this underground network of tunnels, but it's up in the mountains. So first you have to get to the mountains, and then once you get there, you have to go down in these tunnels. And they have all kinds of really neat things, like a really long descending staircase down straight into the mouth of a machine gunner's nest. Like there's a right angle at the bottom of the stairs you have to take, and there's nothing but a machine gun turret at the bottom. Not really a turret, it's just a wall with a slit in it. So, I mean, obviously the way you try to get around that is you pour something down in the, you know, in the stairs. And I don't know, it's it's very, very well defended. That's like video games, man. Like a side-scroller 8-bit game. It's like Wolfenstein. Yeah. It feels exactly like Wolfenstein. Well, I mean, you know, like in, in Mario... Is Super Mario Brothers, the original one. How many times did you be at a place? And you're like, if that stupid turtle wasn't right there, this would be the easiest thing in the world. But that's yeah. exactly the wrong place for there to be a stupid turtle. Right. And, except in right. this case, it's a, um, well, it's a machine gun. That was a really strategic location. I mean, the term strategic could mean many different things. Like if it's just ease of a defensive position, the castle in Heidelberg's pretty good. But I don't just mean ease of defense. I mean, I suppose there are all kinds of places in the world that I could easily defend, but nobody would ever want it. I mean, ease of defense coupled with people would really want it. Have you been to Malta? No, I haven't. Malta was fought over back in the 1500s. That's one of the Mm -hmm. locations that I studied on for this. I found that to be really, really interesting. In general, islands tend to be good, right? Because you have to get to them by boat and you can let people in or out. I mean, those are really cool. There's this really cool castle in the middle of the uh, the Rhine River in Germany, and this guy owned it, and you had to get to it by boat, but he had these chains that he would pull up from the river. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I'll let you run with that one. No, I mean, that that's it exactly. That is a place where I would submit to you that if we restarted world history a hundred times, one hundred times somebody's going to figure out that that's a pinch point that grants or restricts access into the rest of their territory. They're going to put a fortification there and they're going to make it so you can't pass that water without their blessing. 100 times out of 100. It's really awesome. And there's another place here in Alabama at the mouth of the Mobile Bay. You've heard the term, damn the torpedoes full speed of head. You've heard that, right? No. Is that something Liam Neeson said in the motion picture Battleship? We're talking about Damn the torpedoes. Alabama history. It's Full a, speed it's ahead. Impo- <laughs> it's important that you take this seriously I know to I am. me. No, I am. <laughs> okay, so the Battle of Mobile Bay. I wrote a, a paper on this when I was in sixth grade. Still remember it to this day. And the Battle of Mobile Bay was interesting because on one side of the bay, you had Fort Morgan. And on the other side of the bay, you had Fort Gaines. And they were set up such that you could fire from one fort to overlap the middle with the other fort. And so in theory, nobody could run through the middle. And the torpedoes at the time were actual aquatic mines they put in the bay. And the idea was they would keep the Union fleet from coming up into Mobile Bay. Okay. And so it was super, super strategic positions, right? In reality, Farragut, the the admiral of the U.S. fleet, he figured out that, well, heck— the angle of depression of the cannons from Fort Gaines can't shoot down close enough to get me if I scoot in real close to it. And they don't have mortars at the fort. I don't know how he knew that. So he took the whole fleet, and he just ran straight up next to Fort Gaines, like as close as you could imagine, like within rifle shot. And he just went straight through there. And so damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. He just kept going. So torpedoes were, like I said, those mines. And so the thought was... If you hit one of these things, you'd blow up and you're dead. Anyway, the there was a a Confederate boat, the the CSS Tennessee, that was made in the UK that fought for a really long time. I don't know. The, the Battle of Mobile Bay is fascinating because it involved forts and fleets and all kinds of stuff. Really fascinating stuff. And it's humbling to hear you talk about that and a reminder that history is an infinite field and I will never know all this stuff because I didn't know about any of that. Hanging out with you makes me feel like I am getting more knowledgeable every hour <laughs> more knowledgeable every hour <laughs> I don't know. okay That's... i'm sorry i'm really excited about this topic dude so i could just babble on so yeah, your and, turn you tell and me i say something. and i say let's just i mean you feel free man so i think i'm still tracking with our flow of thought here and i've got it mapped in my brain my question to you 
is still, well, you kind of just answered it. Have you ever seen a place that if the world started over 100 times, that would be a strategic location that defenses would be built? And you just talked about the Mobile Bay. I mean, it's dependent on what kind of weapons are developed, right? Yes. Because, yes. because if cannons aren't a thing, nobody cares about Mobile Bay. Yes. Or but they don't care about those points. Something that has existed for all of time is the ability for a person on foot to kill another person on foot, which yes. means that we all know that if somebody has the high ground, they automatically win and you should just quit or else all your limbs will get cut off. So getting the high ground... Yeah, exactly, Anakin. I don't know what you're talking about. would be a great idea. And so historically, these castles aren't just protecting the rock on which they sit. They have a sphere of influence, an aura, an orbit, a feather effect, where effectively the size of the garrison inside that fortress is big enough that it could be deployed within a a day or two's march of everything within that sphere of influence. So in other words, if you want to do anything within that sphere of influence, you have to eliminate that castle first. So when I first started thinking about sieges, I was like, well, why not just not? Like, why go to their castle? They're waiting for you right there. I mean, mean, why walk straight into the boss's lair? Just go, I don't care, like raid some stuff or kill some things. Just don't. But the, the point is, you can't. And that's why the whole of Europe is is spotted with these defensive outposts. Because if you were to put, well, I mean, picture like a Petri dish and you have some kind of culture in there and you put teeny tiny little drops of Clorox around it. They'll all have auras. And if they all overlapped, well, then the entire Petri dish is is now clean. Same thing with Europe or somewhere you're trying to defend throw a power center everywhere it's all within a day or two's march of a certain garrison make reciprocal agreements with your neighbors and raiders can't do anything in your territory then ultimately there's always going to be a key fortress that is the most defensible the largest garrison and that seems to be where the fights just inevitably drift toward in history so that what you're trying to defend regionally is really significant to how big or how good a fortress you build. Does that make sense? It does, but something that I've, as I read this stuff, some of it just is perplexing because it's like, okay, for example, in Malta, right? Okay. So the Ottoman Empire wants to come and take over all these knights that are holed up in Malta. What is this, 1500s? I don't know this. Yeah, these are leftover crusader states. Yeah, so they're hanging out, and then all of a sudden they're like, hey, what if we just go take over that fort. What I don't understand is why don't they just bypass Malta? Because there's this one fort there. Why don't they just go to the other side of the island or something like that? You know what I'm saying? Right. And again, it's about sphere of influence. They can go over there and sit on the other side of the island for a little while if they want, but they can't do anything there. They can't build anything there. They can't get a foothold there because the fleet is protected and controlled from the fortress on the other side of the island. You have to deal with that. Which is near the natural harbor. Yeah, so let's say let's say you want to go camping with some buddies. I want to go camping with some buddies. Yeah, oh, great. <laughs> and let's say you pack up all your stuff, right? You've got your little camping outfit on, and you guys go out into the woods, and you're like, I want to camp in this really pretty place on this guy's property. But the guy on the property has a sign up that says, I'll kill anybody who tries to camp on this property. Well, I mean, I guess you could just not go to where that guy is and hope it works out. But really, you can't set up camp because now you're immobile and vulnerable on the home turf of somebody else. You don't feel real comfortable taking a nap at your desk at work if there's an intruder in the building, even if he's in another room. You know what I mean? You have to deal with the threat first. Basically, you can never have peace unless you've dealt with a threat, is what you're saying. That is correct. Got it. You you know what's so interesting about this is you use the term camping. That's what Ulysses S. Grant said at Vicksburg. So you have the Mississippi River. So do you know the two... uh, I'm so sorry. I I know you know this better than I do. The two opposing plans for the Civil War, you had the Anaconda Plan Mm -hmm. or the Rattlesnake Plan. There were two opposing thoughts, you know, let's choke out the South or let's just strike deep to the heart quickly. I know the Anaconda plan is the one where they don't want none. And No, I'm thinking of something different. 
I, no, I guess, okay. You'll, I'll let you explain them. Shut up. <laughs> it's the song, Matt. <laughs> I'm in such a serious place because I'm so excited. And you keep derailing me with Star Wars references and my anaconda don't want... <laughs> what do you think I'm here for? <laughs> Dude. No, I'm not going I'm to this so- time. Okay, so you got the two plans. Yeah, you got the two plans. Anyway, so um, Grant really wanted to just take Vicksburg as quickly as possible. And yes. obviously they couldn't do that. And he wrote in his memoirs, he's like, well... I guess we're going to have to outcamp them. So he basically resigns to a traditional siege, which he didn't want to do, and he says, literally, what we're doing is trying to outcamp them. Who can mm-hmm. camp better at this point? That's what it is. Yeah. That's really well put. I have not heard that he said that. Didn't Grant even, in the process of outcamping, didn't he dig a canal like in Louisiana or something? To uh... I'm sitting here looking at it right now, Grant's Canal, yeah. So... That is a weird thought. I'm going to re. I think we mentioned this earlier. I'm going to reroute an entire river. Uh huh. Because I want my boats to go in a certain location. That's a crazy thought. That's similar to what Alexander the Great did at the the Phoenician, you know, Tyre and Sidon. You know about that? Oh yes, great reference. Yes. Okay, so here's the deal. Can I try this and you correct me when I'm wrong? Yeah, yeah. Rock and fire. Okay, I'm overextended here. So whatever. You're you're great. You got this. Go. Okay, so you've got these two these two cities. You've got Tyre and Sidon, right? And they, they're on different sides of the water. This is in the Mediterranean, correct? Yeah, it's just like modern-day Lebanon, I guess. Yeah, and so basically the Phoenicians are really good boat builders, and they're out there in Tyre on the island. I oh, mean, I'm so... No, you're doing I, I'm great. So, I'm so unsure of myself. I'll make grunting sounds when you're wrong. Okay, they're out there oh. on this island, and long story short, Alexander the Great's like, I'm going to freaking whip you, and they're like, no. He goes, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to burn down the city of Sidon, and we're going to just pick it up and put it into the water and build uh-huh. a land bridge to you and freaking kill you. <laughs> yes. And he did. And what's cool about that one is it's in the Bible like hundreds of years before it happened. That was pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, a lot of people do read that that way. That That is interesting. Uh, no, no, it didn't. it didn't work. What do you mean it didn't work? The bridge proved overwhelmingly to be a waste of time. Okay. So the Tyrians, I think that is what you call them, the Tyrians were able to harass the engineers as they were building the bridge. Because again, this bridge isn't just like some single person swinging footbridge that would create a death alley. It wouldn't work. You got to move a lot of troops across this bridge. And so Alexander worked on it for months, but the Tyrians were able to prevent the progress and then eventually I didn't look this one up but I think eventually they burned part of it or destroyed part of it or weather did and Alexander was like fine forget it I'm 20 years old all I want to do is kill the world how hard is it and so he (laughs) summoned favors from quote liberated cities along the way and they finally sent ships and then Alexander handled it by boats and up until that point Alexander had been kind of a goofball when he beat people, like he'd been kind of benevolent and also, I don't know, am I allowed to say, did the 4th century BC equivalent of teabagging his fallen opponents just a little bit? Because it's did. basically what it, I guess I just did. <laughs> we'll decide how offensive that is later. Because like he just won the Battle of Issus just north of there. And like in that battle, he shamed his opponent Darius by capturing like i don't remember like his wife and his daughter or something and being like uh well i decided to let your wife and daughter go free if they wanted to but they both like me better now so i married your daughter (laughs) and now i call your mom my mom so your mom's my mom so that just happened (laughs) yeah like like, yeah because he's a cocky like you know i don't know what he was probably like 22 at this point i mean he's a kid He's never meaningfully been beat. Aristotle was his personal teacher, and he like he just knows no limits. So he's such a goofy, funny, brave, sort of irritatingly endearing winner. And then his demeanor changed because of a siege. Sieges mess with people, dude. They break people, dude, because people get desperate. Yep. I mean, you run out of food. You get angry because you, you come up, up against the first thing that you literally cannot cross yep you can't do the thing you want to do yep yeah it's just like traffic like why do people rage when you're sitting in traffic it's because you want to be somewhere you want to accomplish something and there's this stupid dumb wall in your way yes and if the wall would just move 
Everything would be cool, but the wall's not going to move. That's what it does to people. Now imagine that that wall sat there in front of you for a year, and every now and then that wall of cars just randomly loaded like the head of some dead soldier on a catapult mounted to the front and launched it onto your windshield. Just picture how much grouchier <laughs> that would make you. Yeah, if, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be too happy. No, there's this long tradition of mockery being a part of sieges. You've seen Monty Python on the Holy Grail, right? That's where I was going, man. I was really? I was just <laughs> yes. I just you do I that. Fought in your general direction. That's what yeah. it is. And 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 yeah. that like that's a riff on all of these stories of the craziest crap that people thought of to provoke and mock their enemies on either side of a siege wall. And so the Tyrians were a little bit smug and it really irritated Alexander that they wouldn't be liberated by him. I'm Alexander the Great. Like, like you know what his mission was, right? It was like to take Greek culture and spread it around and don't kill people you don't have to, mingle them together and unify the world under his leadership. He didn't want to kill the Tyrians. He was delivering freedom to everyone? Yeah. You know what these people need? Freedom. They need, they need freedom they right need now. They need freedom, so freedom. <laughs> they need freedom so bad I'm going to tear their walls down and give them freedom right in their faces. <laughs> <laughs> freedom is the only way, yeah. The, <laughs> the, the, what a line. What We're, a line. Here's what so, I think we should do, Matt. I, I think we should... Uh, Clearly, we're both motivated to talk about sieges. Yes. I think we should break just for a second. Uh-huh. We should um, collect our thoughts, do a quick Why? little ad, okay. and then let's try to get some structure to this because we're just like, we're so excited. We're all over the place. We, th- we say we huddle up and figure out how we want to attack this. Okay. See what I did there? See what I did there? I see what you did there, and it was excellent. And as I so often do, I've still got this map in my brain, and I can see the exit ramp in front of us that gets us where you want to be, so I'm going to take it right now. Do it. I'm in the car. After Alexander. Somebody just hit the car with a oh, head. Oh, my goodness. That's... <laughs> Sorry. Go, go ahead. I'm back in the car. I'm back in the car. Okay. Good, good, good. Run the wipers. Okay. There they go. <laughs> the uh, He killed everybody entire, dude. And honestly, to me, that is that is Alexander's Anakin in the Jedi Temple moment. I'm trying so hard to be with you right now, but I just imagine, I just imagine we're on I-565 <laughs> in a little Toyota Corolla and, <laughs> and, the, and the truck in front of us just <laughs> trebucheted a human head <laughs> in our windshield. <laughs> this is not, I'm sorry. I'm, so, I'm sure you have a really important history point here. What the heck? Was that Dale? Yeah. <laughs> Really intelligent podcasting here. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> so, so uh, it was his it was his Anakin turn to the dark side moment. In my humble opinion, uh, he was a different dude. That siege broke his brain. And what I want to talk about when we come back from our little breaky break time, are you thinking about breaking the brain because a head hit the windshield? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. All right. You went. Keep literal. going. Finish. <laughs> finish. So, what I want to talk about when we come back from the little break is the psychology of the siege thing because i think that's the really fun part and that's really how it's won and lost and you're going to tell me why it's actually ballistas and trebuchets excellent point matt well thanks for saying that this episode of no dumb questions is brought to you by hello fresh destin what is hello fresh HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. And talk to me about the selection side of this. Dude, you uh, you go to the website, which is hellofresh.com slash NDQ is what I would recommend. You go there, and there's all different types of meals you can choose from. You select what makes the most sense for your family and your dietary restrictions, and then you can choose whichever one looks the yummiest to you. That's what I judge it on. It's the yummy factor. You select that, and then just send it to your house, and you can cook it. It makes you feel like a genius because you know exactly what you're doing. Somebody on Twitter threw something our way. I think they were making chicken parm at their house. I haven't had that yet. Yeah. Big fan of the chicken parm. Just anything that you can think of, they've thought of a way to package up and send in a way that makes it easy for you to do the cooking yourself, fun to do the cooking yourself. You're going to learn something, and it feels really good when you made it and everybody in your family actually likes it. So talk to me about what it's like to actually order this thing. 
What do you mean? I mean, you get to choose like one of three different. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, like, what, what's it like to place an order and have it show up? Okay, so there's three different things you can choose from: the classic meal plan, the veggie, or the family. You choose whichever one you want, and then this selection of all these ingredients comes to your house in a cooled box. They've got these ice packs that are in there. You get this cardboard box, shows up at your house, it's insulated, and then you pull all the stuff out and just set it right in the fridge. And the cool thing about it is everything's in one bag, so if you send the kids to grandma's or whatever, you can just pull that bag out of the fridge and you hand it to grandma with the kids, and then, I don't know, my kids like to cook it. It's I don't, it's fun, man. I dig it. And it's really good and tasty. What about you? What's your favorite part? Well, right now, one of the things that has been the nicest is we're not being penalized for being on this big, gigantic road trip that we're on because they're super flexible with, hey, we need your service this week. Hey, we're going to be out of town and don't need it this week. You can fire it up and back off of it, put it on hold whenever you need to. So they're, they understand how life works and they make it really flexible and easy for people like us who are on the go. Basically, you just click pause. Is that what you did? Yeah, I think it's about that simple. I think Camilla actually physically clicked the button for us. But yeah, I mean, you order what you want, you get what you want. Works great. Yeah, it works out to less than 10 bucks per serving, and there's free shipping, so it's really great. I mean, I paid $10.33 for tacos at lunch today, and this meal is way better, and it's better for you, blah, blah, blah. You just really need to try HelloFresh. Not just saying this, it's awesome. So for $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com slash NDQ and enter NDQ. And when you support HelloFresh, you support the podcast. And this is a sponsor that you and I have talked about for a long time. And so for people who've been listening to this forever, they know we talk about HelloFresh a lot because we genuinely like HelloFresh a lot. So this, this is an unbelievably easy thing for us to encourage you to try out. And we hope you will. And we know you're going to love it. Yeah, they've partnered with the podcast. They like supporting No Dumb Questions. You guys obviously have responded to these ads, and I can't thank you enough. So, again, to say that one more time, it's for $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. Visit HelloFresh.com slash NDQ and enter NDQ. It's a big deal. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and I love it when you tweet about it. It's always fun to see what you're cooking and what you're eating. And that last tweet that I saw, the dude who was making the chicken parm, HelloFresh actually responded to that. So that was fun too. So he tagged them and us? Yeah. That's awesome. And them and us replied. So that was cool. That is killer. I love that. Thank you guys. Speaking of killer, let's go back to talking about seizures. (laughs) It's awful. (laughs) So circling all the way back around to what we were saying a little bit ago, where you were arguing that sieges are an open loop versus a closed loop, right? That was your read on it? Correct. Here's why I would say no. If a siege pits, say, 50,000 attackers against, say, 30,000 defenders, that's 80,000 people. Let's say this siege is happening in the Middle Ages. How is the land going to support that number of people for an extended period of time? Well, I mean, rape and pillage burn the village the attacking army normally takes over the local area and takes all their food. Uh, yeah. How far will that go? Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're going to deplete the local area of resources quickly. That's correct. And most defenders would not be surprised by a siege. I mean, it's not like if there's an army of, you know, 50,000 crusaders marching on Antioch, it's not like the people of Antioch wouldn't get word of that in advance. Like, a group of people the size of your city is walking toward your city right now. I mean, you can't prepare ahead of time because you don't have, like, the telegraph and you don't have radio back then. Yeah, but you've got a huge orbit of influence of people who are going to be more aligned with you than they are with the others. And you're going to have a network of information to communicate that kind of advanced warning. You're going to know. You can't move an army that big that fast the main thing that happens is people i mean they get rid of the civilians and anybody that eats that's not a fighting age person they get them out of the way as quickly as possible get on a horse get out of here we're going to keep people with armor and shields and know how to light pitch on fire and pour it on people that's what we're keeping here again you would think all of those things but that's often not how it bore out Hmm. refugees would crowd into cities and the cities would swell 
when they were under siege. There's one example of a siege in Germany in the Middle Ages where partway through the siege, the defenders were like, we just cannot sustain the refugees. So they sent the refugees out to their opponent. And the opponent was like, we don't want them, but we're also not going to let them pass. So all like 12,000 refugees sat in the ditch, the dry moat between the castle and the attackers and slowly starved to death and rotted right there in that ditch in front of everybody. And, and they couldn't leave? Nope. The uh, attackers wouldn't let them leave. Why? Uh, I don't know, because you hate them and you want to kill them and you want to win. But they're civilians. Yeah, that's not how everybody thinks throughout history. So Yeah, actually, in Aleppo, that got weird. In Syria. You mean um, recently? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm told that, you know, you have you looked at any of the news articles on that? Have you watched any of the video from that? Some. It's. I mean, it's been a while. We talked about it a few days ago. You talked about the guy who filmed stuff about it and posted it. Yeah, it's pretty wild. The, the thing is, a lot of times people that are part of the fighting force will act like a civilian to sneak around and sneak out. And, yeah. you know, that, that's the thing that guy said. He, he said, my neighbors appear to be working for both sides. I, I said that earlier. But it's very interesting that it's unclear who's the fighting force and who's just a yeah. normal civilian at that point. Yeah. And when everybody's sick and emaciated, I suppose everybody could pass as a refugee. So if, if they send 12,000 people out and they're like, don't kill them, those totally aren't soldiers or people who are going to work for us, just let them through, are you going to take that risk? No. Maybe you would in 2018, but in 1400? <laughs> like, if you're wrong and those were fake refugees, you lose and all the people you care about die. Sieges are horrible, dude. They're the worst. But here's, here's what I'm driving at on this whole closed loop, open loop thing. And I think it's really important to, to nail this down before we get further down the road here. The idea of the closed loop is exaggerated because provisions would be enormous because you have time to prepare for a siege. And secondly, any fortress worth its salt has some way to get in and out and maybe even an internal water supply to keep things clean and you know, to, keep, to keep your forces watered. So it's more open than you would figure what you imagine to be an open loop is more closed than you would figure because of how painstaking it is not just to move an army, but to raise an army. Remember, it's not until the mid to late 1300s that you start to see any kind of standing armies happening in Europe. Like prior to that, and still overwhelmingly on into the early modern age, armies are farmers. Like They're people who get called up for campaign season for a month or so every year to go and you know, have a little football game style skirmish. Maybe a couple of people get killed and we get to steal your crops and that's that. And we'll do it again next year. Like, it's very hard to raise another fighting force to come and support you in the process of a siege, even though you're theoretically outside the walls. Yes. Especially if you don't have a formalized government at that point in time. Yeah. All you've got is a nobility hierarchy and well, generally speaking, if you're a part of a nobility hierarchy and another nobleman dies, it's actually kind of good for you. So there could be some nefarious motivations even in choosing to offer or withhold support. But further, those inside the castle, like they are going to lay waste to their own turf. We've got records of forests being completely cleared, villages being burned down by their own people, food being destroyed crazy steps being taken to make sure there is nothing outside these walls to support these attackers who are on their way here. They will find nothing but blood and ash when they come and try to mess with our fortress. That is how they wanted it to be. That's crazy. Okay, I'm dying here. I, I really want to talk about weapons. It's time to go weapons. Yeah? So, in general... You talked about the fact that the foot, foot soldiers could go up against foot soldiers. So there's a point in warfare where people line up with sharp sticks and poke each other, right? <laughs> that sounds so adorable. That's what they do, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard poking. It's it's like heavy poking. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> at the beginning, what's the first siege you, you know of? The first one I'm aware of is the Battle of Jericho. Does that count as a siege? Uh, yeah. What's the first one that you know of in history? 
And what kind of weapons would be Ooh. used there? So Battle of Jericho, which I think happened, how that exactly went down is obviously a subject of debate. The biblical account says people blew trumpets and the walls collapsed miraculously. Yeah. And obviously somebody who is not Jewish or a Christian is going to be pretty skeptical of that. But that's what the Bible describes in that situation. Yeah. If that went down, there's some weird physics going on, right? Yeah. But what I will say is this, just because of that you know, sphere of influence of fortresses, and I was just at Jericho like last week, I can picture it, you couldn't take that area on the west side of the Dead Sea without taking Jericho. So we know that the Israelites ended up in Canaan, which means they had to have occupied Jericho to do it. So that much we know. So when is that, dude? That's got to be 13. Well, the early date for the Exodus is like 1200 something or the late date early is like 1400. So put it somewhere in there. Yeah. So is that the earliest siege that you know of? Is there one earlier? There weren't that many fortress cities before that. Okay, cool. I'm just setting boundary conditions. I'm trying to figure out where the earliest recorded record of a siege, you know, whether people think it happened or not. Yeah. You know. And I'm stalling because I want to be all smart and be like, well, actually, <laughs> there's this one, but that's all I got. Let's go Jericho. On one side, we've got trumpets and banging pots on the ground, right? Those are the <laughs> weapons that they used to take down the, the, the walls. Yes. And ribbons hung by prostitutes. Yeah. That, that's a very fascinating story. And what book is that in? In the Bible. Do you know? Joshua. Okay. Yeah. Oh, dang. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. I, I feel ashamed. There is a anyway, song. Anyway, <laughs> there is a song. So yeah, so that's that's the first account that I'm aware of. And so moving forward, what's the, what's the next big siege activity that, that you're aware of? Well, um, All I know is the Greeks and the Romans, right? And so I'm, I'm moving yeah. towards what kind of weapons they used. There are more biblical examples. Um there are sieges in the ancient Near Eastern fights with the Assyrians, um, the Babylonians. But yeah, I, I, let's warp up to the Greeks. Okay, so they the Greeks had this really neat device. It's basically a siege engine, and the translation is taker of cities, right? It starts okay. with an H. What, what's it called? I know you know how to you know how to say it. I don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yeah, butcher it. Let's hear it. I want to hear your version. So here's the thought. A siege engine is this device. Let's say you have a really big wall, and you've got to get over the wall. Well, mm -hmm. step one, walk up with a ladder, put the ladder against the wall, climb up, and say, excuse me, sir, I'm here to take your city. But that doesn't work, obviously, because he has a stick, and he pokes you in the eye, right? Sure, so, or a rock. Or he pushes your ladder off the wall. That's well, that the stinks. best strategy right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's that. Well, the next thing we do is we're going to walk up, and we're going to try to, I don't know, climb the wall. But then he pours boiling oil on you. That stinks. Probably so it's water, all about sure. <laughs> it's all about offensive tactics and countermeasures. That's what the game becomes. And so eventually, the invention of the siege engine happens. And the way I heard it uh, described is this thing. If I'm not mistaken, this was a Greek invention. This thing is. Uh, what is it, 90 cubits high? Am I saying that right? God, I really want to get this right. And 45 cubits wide. It's a 90 cubits high. That's like an elbow to a fingertip, right? That's a cubit? Yeah, it's over 100 foot high and then over 60 foot wide. God, I feel, I'm, wow. totally, butcher, I'm totally butchering this, but they basically build a movable tower. And mm -hmm. it takes a huge team of men to, to move this thing around and it has multiple layers. And so you go up to the, the side of the, the wall and you open up, it's just imagine, have you ever written Tower of Terror? No, but it sounds awesome. Yeah, it is. You basically get in this elevator, and the elevator breaks, and you fall down. But imagine going up and down on steps or something like this, and you could open a door, and then you could do things to the wall or the attacker or whatever, all the while providing shields for yourself. That's what a siege engine is. It's this big, movable building that you can move up directly next to a wall, and then you can open doors, and you can basically molest the wall in whatever way you you choose like so many be, words you could have picked really glad I know. you went with molest I, I just i don't know it felt right and so basically you're doing bad things to the wall right that <laughs> word works <laughs> yeah no it's it's great it's perfect you That's know how many you know how many jokes i just had to skip out of an 12. attempt at decency is actually 12. 14 but that's a great yeah. guess yeah anyway that's a siege engine right so what's the counter to a siege engine Okay, best movie example I've ever seen of that technology? What? Return of the King. Oh, yeah? Can you picture the siege of Minas Tirith? 
the Battle of Pelennor Fields. You remember this? In Lord of the Rings? Yeah, the third one. All I can picture is the orcs running up at the base of the wall with gunpowder. It's on YouTube. You should just watch it real quick. Siege engine, return of the king. Yeah, siege of Minas Tirith, something like that. Of course you would know the names of these things. What? Who doesn't? Come on. Everybody knows that. It's common knowledge. I know Helm's Deep. That's all I know. Which is also a siege. The second movie and the third movie both end with sieges. Isn't that interesting? It is. You know, something that I think a lot in my in my life is when he yells out, to the keep, and they retreat inwardly mm-hmm. towards the center of the fortress, to the keep! You know, okay, well, that perimeter is too large to, to defend. Let's go into the smaller de- perimeter. Yes. Yeah, so... I actually think that in my own life at times when there's so much going on around me and I can't keep up, like, you know, family members are injured or whatever, I just say, to the keep, and I retreat inwardly, and I'm like, okay, it's all about family right now. Forget everything else that's going on outside. I just got to hold out in here until a white wizard shows up and saves me. With fireworks. That's right. Yes. Anyway, so siege engines were a thing. Obviously, the other weapons that everybody knows about are the ballista. Whoa, 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 whoa. hold on. Before we get on to the ballista thing. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, what? Lord of the Rings, though, at the Battle of Helm's Deep, all of those orcs and Urakai, they attack the fortress at Helm's Deep head on, and how do they scale the walls there? Do you remember? No, I don't. Is it grappling hooks? Ladders. They just come up with a whole bunch of ladders, and they swing them up. And they try to go with so just such overwhelming numbers that the defenders won't be able to deal with the ladders. And then they they engage in another technique that we'll talk about later, trying to strike at the base of the wall. And that's what ultimately creates the breach that they get through and causes the to the keep moment to happen, right? Right. So what's interesting is from the end of the second book or movie to the end of the third They've adjusted their strategy, and instead of coming out with ladders to attack Minas Tirith, they come out with these huge siege engine towers, just exactly like you described. And they've got these drawbridges at the top that they just flop down, and they just try to flood the ramparts and overwhelm the human defenders on top of the walls. Like, obviously it's ridiculous, because it's elves riding on, you know, surfboard shields down elephant trunks and doing cartoon moves, but... It actually portrays some of these siege elements really well. Ooh, I'm watching this in the background right now, the the Battle of Helm's Deep, and Mm -hmm. they're moving these ladders up with people on the ladders. Mm -hmm. It's a, hey, we're just going to do this right now, and we're probably going to die, but we're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Golly, when you finally decide we're going to go up against a heavily fortified position, and we're going to try to, man, this is weird. The, The YouTube suggested video is a bunch of orc faces like, you got orc face, you got, like, some elf with a crossbow or something like that, and then you've got me talking to President Obama. That's the only thing. I'm going I'm to screenshot this and send this to you. It is so weird. That sounds <laughs> phenomenal. Oh, I'm going to get talked to you, dude. I think there's a policeman coming to talk to me oh, literally really? right now. To the keep. To the yeah, keep. to the keep. Oh, he's going to talk to me right now. Hang on. Hang on. Evening, sir. How are we doing? Doing great, man. Just just one guy here. <laughs> you ready for the weirdest story you're gonna hear all night? I don't know. I have are a podcast. I have a podcast on the internet with my buddy in Alabama, yeah. and I literally have a microphone. I I'm traveling, so I tried to go somewhere quiet where I wouldn't bother anybody and it wouldn't be noisy. Yeah. You can be on it if you want. Nope, it's all you. <laughs> Am I okay sitting here? Or would you like me to relocate? No, no, you're good. You're good. All right, thank you, sir. Don't break it, man. I promise I won't. Have a good night. He is not angry. He sounded really cool. That guy was as chill as could be. Just like, oh, I get it. It's cool. Did you hear me offer to let him be on the show? I did. You know what's uh, what's crazy about being a policeman? What's that? They walk up to your vehicle, which... It's kind of like a heavily fortified position, <laughs> and they have no idea what they're going to encounter. That's right. That takes a lot of bravery. Yeah, this guy was super smart about it. He came in on my right. I'm facing a field, so I can't pull out. He came in on my right and put 
all of his lights right on me. So I was pinned in this little cul-de-sac area at the end of the parking lot. That's smart. Then he left those lights on me and got out and flanked around behind the vehicle where it would be very hard for me to see him. And so I was like, I know what you're doing. So I turned on the vehicle. I didn't start it. Turned on all the lights inside, rolled down all the windows and put both hands out the window. Yep. So he could really clearly see that. Not a uh, gun. There's nothing in these hands. It's all good. I think he just appreciated that I did that so it wouldn't feel like he was storming the truck. So you just surrendered. That's how you surrender in a fort. You're like, you open it up and you're like, this is everything I got and there's not a weapon here. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. And I'm going to come back to an example of a time when that happened instantly. Do it now. Yeah, now's good. Yeah. You ever heard of Ethan Allen, the furniture maker dude? No. Really, you never heard of Ethan Allen furniture? No. I think of it as being like classic colonial style American, but the truth to be told, I don't know anything about it. I'm just guessing. So I don't know if their branding has worked on me or not. But Ethan Allen was one of the quirky founding fathers of the United States. He ran with a group called, oh man, is it the Green Mountain Boys? It is the Green Mountain Boys. A bunch of Vermonters who used intimidation to try to settle a land dispute in a bunch of settlements that were kind of in the blurry zone between New York and New Hampshire. So they basically went around and were like, hey, people in charge, I think that the people who live on this property own it, not some baron from England, right? It'd be a pity if we had to come back here, right? And so they were kind of like Robin Hood types in a way. I mean, the locals loved them. Well, right as things started to fire up with the Revolutionary War, there was talk about the need to deal with Fort Ticonderoga, which is right here where I'm at right now on, what is it, Lake George in eastern New York. Very strategic position, controls this really important waterway north-south that connects all the way up into uh, the St. Lawrence River. Hmm. So before Benedict Arnold could be mustered formally by the Americans, Ethan Allen rounded up a bunch of Green Mountain Boys and was like, we'll just do it ourselves. And so he goes hustling off without any endorsement to take this fort with some good old boys from the hill country. And just as they get there, they run into Benedict Arnold and they're like, well, I'm not backing down. Well, I'm not backing down. Fine. We'll do it together. So they go and raid the fort. And when they size it up, they're like, I think the garrison is gone. So Ethan Allen just walked into the fort and was like, uh, hey, I'm, I'm here to see the fort commander, please. And the person in charge is like, all right. And so then Ethan Allen went and knocked on the door of the fort commander. was like, hey, need you to yield your sword because we're going to take it now. And the guy was like, oh, okay. What? The end. That's how that... they got Fort Ticonderoga. Really? Yeah. From the British? Yeah. Weird. It's considered like the first meaningful victory in the American Revolution. And it's funny because the, the numbers are so tiny. And ultimately, like some guy in his underwear is uh, the one who laid down the sword. So did they populate it afterwards? Like, did they get militia and put them in there and pretend like yeah. you know what you're doing? Yeah, the British got it back, and I'm not sure the Americans recovered it before the end of the war. I think one of the terms of the victory agreement, the peace agreement after Yorktown, was that the British would have to abandon forts like that. Just so I'm tracking the metaphor, in this case, the policeman was Ethan Allen, and you were the old guy in your underwear, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly oh, it. Uh, okay, just making yeah. sure. I and was both my hands you. are out the window. I'm laying down my sword. <laughs> we are completely good. I don't. I don't even like this truck that much. <laughs> okay. You want me to get out, and lay on my back, and show you my belly? Here it is. I yield. <laughs> okay, getting back to weapons. So a ballista was basically a really big crossbow. Yeah. And the more I think about ballistas, the more I'm not impressed. To be honest with you. Whoa! Because, what? But it looks yeah. so awesome. It does, but I, I built a ballista when I was younger. I had no idea it was called a ballista. I just wanted to build a big crossbow. And so I got this tree, and I bent it in half, and then I made this thing that would pull it back, and I would shoot arrows made out of fishing rods. And I could shoot them, you know, I don't know, maybe 40 feet. I thought it was amazing. <laughs> but it would have done absolutely no damage to anything. 
Yeah, that's weird how shooting fishing rods at 20 foot thick fortifications don't damage. But don't you think it might have done more damage if your ballista, say, shot further than 40 feet and maybe shot like 35 to 55 pound giant metal bolts? Maybe, but what's interesting to me about mechanical weaponry is you're limited by what potential energy you can get out of a falling object in the case of a trebuchet or what strain energy you can put into wooden beams in the case of a ballista. Hmm. And it's not a lot. It's not a lot. You have to make a really stinking big beam bend in order to get anything meaningful out of a ballista. I would think. I don't know. I mean, I deal with rockets and stuff. I've never seen an actual ballista fire, but compressed gas, I've seen some crazy stuff happen with compressed gases. Yeah. So, I don't know. Ballistas just don't impress me when I see drawings and stuff like that. Now, they said they made the ropes out of human hair or sinew and things like that, but the beams were just really big wooden beams, as far as I understand. Did they make them out of metal, as far as you know? Well, some parts. I mean, Romans are the ones who came up with ballistas, right? And then it was kind of lost to the West until sieges became really popular in the high and late Middle Ages, and then they went back and revisited Roman writing to try to figure out how to make ballistas. And a lot of people think that they never caught up with how good they were during Roman times. But my understanding is that you had two opposite cranks to create potential energy that you would then loose all at once. Is that right? Like two opposite cranks? How do you charge a ballista? Basically, you have a winch and you pull back the bowstring, if you will, if it's a crossbow, and you lay something in the, uh, God, I don't, I don't know the words and I feel dumb because I don't, but you, you lay something in there and fire it. Anything from special bolts to pointed like logs or, you know, long poles or human bodies in the case of biological warfare, where you want to take like a diseased body and throw yeah. it over the, the castle wall. Oh, isn't that a treat? Which had to be terrifying. Or a three weight fly rod. <laughs> If you wanted to allow the defenders to fish. Now, look, man, you, you laugh at me, but Kinda. imagine a young boy that doesn't know anything about mechanics. All he knows is how to operate a few crude tools. What? And I, I went out into the woods and I got a tree. And I <laughs> You built don't know anything freaking... about mechanics, but you built a ballista? Yeah. I mean, as a child, right? I think you were a prodigy, man. It didn't do anything. It was just my attempts to... My favorite thing that I built when I was younger before I had any formal training wasn't the boomerang, which was fun, but was the uh, atlatl. Do you know about the atlatl? I didn't know that you made one, but those are amazingly simple and amazingly effective. Yeah, I experimented with those. And so I abandoned the ballista and went to the atlatl and spent a lot of time trying to perfect that, the length of the atlatl and how to throw it and stuff like that, which basically extends the length of your arm so you can get more leverage and throw a spear yeah. longer. Really you cool. You can kill a mammoth with one of those suckers, buddy. Be careful. Can you? I mean, isn't that how primitive man is depicted as having taken down mammoths? I don't know, man. I, I hurt myself with one one time because I was cleaning it while it was loaded. And I mean, other than that, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I didn't really do that. I so, know people for whom that's not a laughing matter. <laughs> okay, so trebuchets. So one, one more question. Yes. Like I feel pretty confident in my understanding of what all of these weapons would be good for in a siege. But I've never understood what a ballista would actually effectively do. Why did they use it? They were incredibly accurate. Compared to trebuchets, ballistas were super, super accurate. And so you could hit the same spot over and over and over. So okay. ballista is for, a, uh, I don't know what you would call it. Like, I'm going to wear out that one window right there. You know, they got the little slit window that they can shoot little arrows out. I'm just going to take out that window by hitting it a million times over and over and over. And that's what they did. And, you know, you could also fling things over walls and stuff like that. But you can control it because the strain energy on the beams is repeatable. And if you know the weight of your projectile or your bolt, then that's repeatable as well. And then it's basic ballistics. You could do the math in a repeatable way, which is interesting because all of these things have one thing in common, and that's that it takes an educated person to devise them or create them. And so in siege warfare, engineers are everywhere. At all times. Yes. Which is fascinating to me because there's always been this silent war underneath normal war. Like you got the guys poking themselves <laughs> with sticks, but then you've got these people that design the sticks that are doing the poking. Yeah, and ideally you want to poke the other guy with a stick, but whatever kind of poking you like. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever. So 
I find that fascinating. Trebuchets, obviously, let's just sling a big rock and hit the walls and try to break them down over time. Or you can also bombard the enemy on the inside, right? But walls are pretty effective at that day and time. I'm assuming yeah. that there, there were not a lot of walls being brought down back in the day. My thoughts. Well, that's a good point. I can't think of a ton of examples of people just rolling up with the trebuchet I mean, like, we'll just go th right through that wall. We probably don't hear about those examples because those fortresses were so weak and vulnerable to a trebuchet that they would forfeit before the shot happened. You know what was more effective? What? What was more effective was sapping. You've heard of sapping? Oh, I was hoping you would talk about sapping. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Run with it. Tell me your read on sapping. So I didn't actually know the word sapping. I knew the concept, but I didn't know the word sapping until I was doing research here, but... Basically, you dig under the walls yes, and you reinforce your tunnels with timbers and things like that. And then at some point, you go in there and you just torch all the timbers. Yes. And then that gives way and the walls come down, or at least large sections of the walls. So sapping was incredibly effective for this really slow drawn. I mean, you got bored people sitting around. Might as well have them dig a trench or something like that. Yes. And so trench warfare, not trenches, but tunnels are super effective during sieges. And so, I mean, I'm assuming there were people on both sides that were digging tunnels for different reasons, to get supplies in and out. Yes. And we have record of fights happening in those unstable, tiny, airless, tight quarter. I mean, you have one guy down in there digging, there's enough air. But you put 30 guys trying to fight with 30 other guys, that air goes away quick. And people would out and out suffocate in those kind of fights. And I've never known for sure if where the word comes from. I've got it on authority from a couple people that it is related. But effectively, when you would engage in sapping and then burn the tunnel, you would sap the strength from the walls. Hmm. I can believe that. Yeah. One of the battles that I read about was the siege in Malta in the 1500s, like I was talking mm -hmm. about earlier. They got down in there and they started making these tunnels and somehow it was figured out. They're like, oh, crap, they're building tunnels under what? And so the defenders, they started building their own tunnel to meet their tunnel, and they mm -hmm. got down there with flamethrowers and started, what? like, torching everything themselves. There was, like, hand-to-hand -hand combat in this tunnel, that this podcast, Jaws of Defeat. They did a really good job of explaining it. There's this battle underground with torches and flamethrowers trying to get the bad guys out of their sapping stronghold. Fascinating. Is that a fact? I had no idea. I can't think of many things more terrifying. That was Ottomans versus Hospitallers, a type of uh, mm -hmm. crusader knight. One of the ways that I've heard that defenders would uh, try to detect for sapping is that they would put bowls of water along the walls. And if sapping was occurring, they would see ripples like when the T-Rex was starting to stomp toward the kids in Jurassic Park. Really? And the ripples would give away what was going on underneath, and then they could try to counter that. Dude, you know what's so fascinating about that? Huh. That kind of stuff happens now. Like, you have to develop a sensor of some sort in order to detect the enemy's new offensive system. If you can detect what they're going to do before they do it, then you can quickly countermeasure it, or come up with a countermeasure to defend against it, but you first have to sense it. And so... There's all kinds of things like that in modern war warfare that we can't... I mean, like, for example, submarine warfare. Mm -hmm. There's sonar buoys all over the ocean trying to detect where the submarines are because the whole game of s submarines is like oh. you don't want people to know where you are. Submarines were so... I mean, they're still a game changer. Yeah. But, wow, in the late 30s, early 40s, that I mean, that's just changed the way... Every, I, that We should not have won World War II. And submarines are a big part of the reason why. Oh, yeah. The U-boats were, I mean, they were unbelievably effective. Oh, it's incredible how much American steel that got pulled out of the mine outside Lander, Wyoming, is sitting on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean because of how effective that campaign was. Yeah. It's nuts. Anyway, we kind of stumbled into something there. And before we get too much further on the weapons of sieges, let's backtrack. So we talked about how to counter sapping. How do you counter a ballista? What do you build to make the ballista ineffective? If you're engineer Destin and you got to crack that nut, what do you do? Thicker walls. That's what I do. 
So effectively, you just make it so there's not some kind of pinch point or clearly visible capstone that could be knocked clean with enough duress. Well, you get this escalation on both sides quickly. So obviously, you see the guy roll up with the ballista, the team of engineers that are operating this thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the longbowman out here to shoot at him. Well, what's the next thing the guys on the ballista do? They build a large wooden plate to go on the front of their ballista so that the only thing that's exposed is the hole through which they shoot the bolt. Right. What's fascinating about that is you see that happen back in the day, and then you later see it happen in the Civil War when cannons come onto the scene. I mean, the Civil War soldiers would create this railroad track that goes right up to the fort, and they've got a cannon, and no joke, they have this big armored inclined plane right in front of their cannon and the only thing that is exposed is the little hole through which the cannon fires yeah. and the guys are just behind it loading the thing it's like man this is like warfare hasn't changed we're just slinging things at each other you know the modern things just happen to explode and we're slinging them faster yeah that's not hard to figure out how do you stop the ballista that now has wood in front of it well if you've got Fire. your own siege works inside your fortifications, and a lot of people don't think about this, but this is something people would do to prepare for a siege. They'd have their own catapults, trebuchets, inside. So oh, one thing you can do is just load up uh, some extra rock and see if you can lob something out there and smash their ballistas, because those should be within range of a trebuchet. I mean, that's crazy. We've just developed fancy ways of reassembling rocks and minerals in order to throw them at each other really fast. That's all we do. That's all we stupid yeah. humans do. <laughs> yeah, you know? well, well, like saltpeter is an important component of gunpowder, right? My understanding. When gunpowder first came on the scene here, I mean, it was in China in like, what, the 9th century BC or AD or something like that? Hundreds of years before it got to Western Europe. But they had to import saltpeter from places like India and Central Asia. They didn't know how to make it. So it was in very short supply initially. And a lot of these seemingly medieval fights that we picture, you know, knights in shining armor and stuff, there were guns at those. Oh, yeah. And it's very likely that there were guns at Agincourt. Agincourt, dude. That's like the height of chivalry and knights in shining armor and all of that stuff. There were guns at Agincourt? That's the thinking. Really? It looks like they didn't come into play greatly because, again, people just didn't know how to use it yet. But... When European, I guess, scientists or whatever you want to call them, figured out how to manufacture saltpeter, all of a sudden they could produce unbelievable, unlimited amounts of gunpowder. And that's when you see the technology really take off. And they went from not being able to generate enough force with their limp gunpowder to generating so much force that it would detonate the, the end of whatever they were shooting it out of. So... The advance in chemistry in devising saltpeter forced an advance in reinforcing the exit hole of you know, a ballistic weapon. And the first thing they thought of was, well, we need to strap this with metal the way you would strap a barrel to keep a barrel from splitting open and leaking. And that's actually why gun barrels are called barrels, because initially that's what held them together to handle the force. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So I went to this Civil War cannon event, right? And these jokers, man, they first of all, they absolutely love what they do. And it's amazing just to watch these people do what they do. But a lot of the barrels were cast bronze, but they had a steel, or maybe it's not steel, it's a wrought iron uh, ring that they heat up and they put on the, the back side of the barrel and then they allow it to cool. And that's what reinforces... You know, because at the back of the barrel, that's where your chamber pressure is the highest, and that's where mm -hmm. the highest likelihood it's going to rupture is. And so they would reinforce that part, and as it goes down the barrel, the pressure decreases. And so they didn't need to reinforce it down towards the end of the barrel. So, I mean, the whole science behind how to make how to make a gun that works is fascinating. And one of the things I'm going to do in an upcoming video is explain how they ignite that. Because you've seen people pull a string? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a it's really neat how that works. I'm going to explain that in the video. Dude, just the history of how to ignite the gunpowder is an amazing story of technological advancement. It is, because you want to get fire down into it, but at the same time, you do, I don't know, you got to keep your powder dry. There's so much stuff there. Yep. But one thing that's fascinating is, obviously, cannons change the game, right? Yes. Because when cannons show up, 
we've got this fort that's impenetrable. You can only sling something so fast with gravity falling in a trebuchet. But then you've got cannons, and all of a sudden, I can go beyond the speed of sound, and I can I can get a massive projectile going really, really fast. I can do armor-piercing projectiles, blah, blah, blah. The cool thing about that is, do you think a like a dirt wall or like a, something fortified with stone and brick would be stronger? Well, interesting. You should bring that up. Do you know the name of the type of fort that dominated the landscape of Western Europe from like 800 AD up until the late Middle Ages? No. It's called a Mott and Bailey. Have you ever seen one of those? No. What does that mean? Did you see Braveheart? Yeah, it's been so long. Just okay. talk, talk to me yeah. like an idiot. Yeah, okay. I, I don't remember. Okay, the fort up north, the English outpost up north. It was all made of wood. It was a stockade. It had like spears sticking out of it like a porcupine and just high wood walls. And that's a castle, and it has a, usually a dry moat around it. It's super cheap to put up. You dig the moat, and you take the dirt out of the moat, and you pile it up on a hill inside the ring of the moat. So all the dirt movement is very efficient. You need it to go from here to there, so it makes it super easy. Then you just stick up wood. That clears the forest around you so you could see any attackers coming. I mean, it really is a, a genius setup. And when catapults and trebuchets were not in wide circulation and use in the early Middle Ages, these things were hugely effective. So William the Conqueror, the Duke of Normandy, who defeated the heralds, at the Battle of Hastings in 1066 AD and conquered. That's the last time England was conquered. These are the forts that he had his subordinates build all over England. And it's why you don't see forts from William the Conqueror era around very much because they just weren't built to last. They were built for the time. So then as projectile efficiency increases, I mean, those stockade forts are great against foot soldiers, great against horses, but, I mean, you can just broadside them with a big giant rock and they're going to crumble like a house of cards, right? What do you mean? The Which ones would crumble? A Mott and Bailey, a stockade fort. So a wood fort on an elevated hill inside of a dry moat. Okay. You know, wood planks aren't going to stand up to... I mean, a 60-foot trebuchet can throw over a 300-pound rock. Right. It's not going to work. And so you see the Mott and Bailey go out of style, but it gets replaced with these defensive stone castles. But have you ever noticed how at the bottom of a lot of those castles, it doesn't go straight into the ground? It's at an angle? Yep. You're the one who knows this stuff, so I'll let you explain why they built that an angle as projectiles became more powerful. Well, I was going to a different place with this. I would have thought that stone forts would be more effective against cannons, right? Because it's a rock, and you think rock's really strong. But actually, it's the earthen works types forts that were stronger because you know you start you saw what happened to Fort Sumter right there's a, mm -hmm. a photo that was taken after the bombardment of Fort Sumter and it's just crumbled to the ground right mm -hmm. that's because you hit a stone wall or bricks they're just gonna they're they're very brittle they're hard and they just shatter and because you have this stone wall and you have this backfill with dirt it just all crumbles and and the dirt pours out well. If you create an earthen bunker designed to take a hit, then the cannonballs will kind of bounce off depending on the angles and slopes in which you create it. In fact, to this day, in the Air Force, if you want to create a depot for your ammo, an earthen works bunker is the way to do it today. Yeah, you see them everywhere. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's amazing. And so that was really surprising to me. I would have thought that stone forts would have been more effective, but they're not. You really want to pile up dirt in an efficient, angled way. That's more important. And I owe you an apology because you asked a very direct question and I was trying to circle around to it. And then I got excited and forgot about the really reasonable question you asked. So yes, I agree that that would be the ideal, but the problem is it's a moot point if you go with a Mott and Bailey fortress because, oh, well, we want projectiles to strike dirt. It's a moot point because the wood is going to be obliterated. Right. Splinters. So you have to build out of stone for all these other defensive reasons, including increasing abilities to send fire, sticky fire, onto your walls. Like your, your castle just can't be built out of wood in the late Middle Ages. It just can't. And so as cannons start to come into vogue 
especially in the late 15th century, and then big time in the 16th century. It'd be great to have dirt works all around your castle, but it's not going to happen. And so one of the solutions that you see happening is more angles on castle, on stone and brick castle walls, instead of flat surfaces, which obviously just diminishes the amount of impact that's going to happen because it's not flat surface striking flat surface. It's going to create glancing blows. But would we agree that this is the moment in history where the equation starts tipping in the favor of the offensive party? Because up to this point, I mean, you can't really do anything with these walls. You just have to outcamp each other. But then at this point, things start getting a little weird. Like, hey, I can suddenly take down your wall unless it's built correctly. Now, the reason Grant had to do a full-on siege at Vicksburg is it was a large area, lots of square meters. And, you know, the, have you ever been to Vicksburg, by the way? I have. Yep. Is it not amazing? Amazing. I appreciate the Gettysburg battlefield. I think Gettysburg is the only Civil War battlefield I've been to that I appreciate more. Yeah, it's fantastic. But anyway, this is this is a really interesting part of history to me because this is the moment where all of a sudden the offensive party can start to do serious damage from afar to you. What, what do you mean by this is the moment? Are you talking about a year or are you talking about a technology? A technology, the highly accurate cannon. I mean, specifically rifled cannons. There was this cannon that was invented. It's called the parrot rifle. You start seeing the parrot rifle in the Civil War, and that was the first rifled... Well, please forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, but I believe it to be one of the first rifled cannons that was used, and it happened in the Civil War. And at that point in time, you could say, I'm going to hit that 10 square foot spot on the fort. I'm going to hit it right now, and I'm going to hit it every two minutes for the next hour. You know what I mean? Wow. And that's a big stinking deal, right? Because it's a lot of it's a lot of energy. Dude, it was crazy up in Tennessee. Seeing them hit their spots with those cannons? Yeah, they had I saw one guy, he had a special type of cannon. I made a whole video just on this one type of cannon called a Whitworth rifle. And it's a hexagonal bullet. It's amazing. It's yeah. It was an English weapon. But I really want a Whitworth rifle. It's a specific type of muzzle loader that has a hexagonal bullet. It's a helical, helical hexagonal bullet, and, man, it could reach out and touch stuff. But anyway, there's a guy there that made one, and he could hit a 55-gallon drum at 600 yards. Whoa! And he could call a shot. He's like, I'm going to hit that drum. Give me two shots to line it in, Whoa. and then it'll just happen. I was like, what? And so he had a scale, and he was measuring his powder. And then he had... Like, his sights were not, it wasn't like a scope. It wasn't like a Leopold or a Tasco scope. He had, like, a pipe with a cr literally crosshair, like pieces of hair kind of thing. Oh, it's amazing. I think he used wire, but he That's could, amazing. He could, but here's the thing. Wait, 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 wait. What's the Go furthest ahead. out that you've really been sighted in effectively with your Barrett? Just a couple hundred meters. No. Yeah. I, I, that's a highly tunable, accurate weapon of war at great range. Yeah. And... We're talking about 1860 technology with that Whitworth. This dude's putting pounds of lead. At, at 1,800 feet, man. Yeah. It's I mean, crazy. That's a third of a mile. Oh, yeah. No joke. There's this one guy. He pulled up a cannon. It was a French cannon from World War I. There's this old gray-haired guy there. And I'm going to be honest. You're walking amongst these guys, and they're hyper excited, and they're they're walking around being goofy. And you kind of think, like, oh, man, these are, like, kooky old grandpas, right? No, they're like CEOs. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because they can afford these cannons. But there's this one guy, he's got this French cannon from World War I. They said the last time it was fired was like 1914 or something like that. And he said, okay, so here's the deal. I bought this cannon. We've been doing some work on it, and we think it'll do this. I was like, what? And the guy goes, yeah, uh, we think it'll shoot this fast. And I was like, well, I happen to know how to do this, and I can tell you within the meter per second how fast this thing is going. And this guy did all the math, and he said, I'm thinking about this. And I kid you not, he got it within five meters per second. My mind was blown. Wow. It was the first time that weapon had been shot in over 100 years. Dude, And but that goes back to what you just said a minute ago about how the real rock stars in a lot of these sieges are the engineers who were on site. And I'll tell you this, they were treated with tremendous reverence because 
you needed that brain to win. And if you don't have that brain, you lose. It's fascinating. I get turbo excited about this stuff. There's one other thing I want to talk about, though. The, you should consider it as a career. Yeah, I should, I should consider that. So you got these earthenworks bunkers, uh, or right. whatever you want to call them, in front of your fort, right? Right. So the idea is a gun shoots flat. So if a gun shoots flat, if I can make something in front of my fort so that that projectile will skip over my head when it hits that angled bank in front of me, I'm impenetrable. As long as I can poke up my head long enough to take a shot at the other guy, I'm fine. And so you started seeing these really cool cannons that would basically pop up, shoot, and then go back down. Have you seen these? No, that's not ringing a bell. Okay, you know those little things... It's it's like a little toy where whack a mole. No, you you pull this hand. Yeah, I'm in a serious place. I'm sorry, but you you pull this handle and the the little boxing glove will jump out and punch. You know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, it's, sure. Yeah, the goofy like little clown extendy. Yeah, sure. It's almost like that, but a cannon. So it's these these turrets. These cannons would pop up. I'm gonna Google pop up turret. This feels like a weapon the Joker would use. This junk is real, man. They made these cannons that would pop up, take a shot, and go back down. Oh god, I I can't find it right now. I'm I'm gonna go crazy if if I just made this up. You hardly but, ever lie to me. I'm, I'm sure you're telling the truth. Okay, whatever. I'm gonna have to Google that later. But I've seen that kind of stuff before, and it's amazing. And as long as you keep everything parallel, you're fine. So anyway, long story short, guns shoot flat. Okay. When guns shoot flat. You can only do so many things, and it's like take out walls, take out personnel that are in the open, things like that. But if people are defilade, so defilade means you're under some kind of natural terrain or under a wall or something like that. You know, what you really want, if you're the guy with a cannon, you want everybody to be, I think the pronunciation is enfilade. I've only seen it in text, but E N F I L A D E. It's a it's a French term. Enfilade. New terms for me. All right. Yeah, basically. The reason why flanking an enemy is so good is because they're all lined up. Mm -hmm. In your cannon, if you could shoot grape shot, you could take out dozens of people as opposed to just one person because the aspect is set up for you, right? Yeah, somebody should have a conversation with Daenerys Targaryen about that very basic strategy. (laughs) With her dragons? I'm not saying. (laughs) Okay, so uh, if somebody's defilade, you can't get them with a gun, a gun being a cannon that shoots flat. You have to go to mortars, right? And so a mortar is something that you lob up high and it falls back down. And so Mm -hmm. you use that parabola to your advantage. And so ideally, you would get defilade with your mortar and you would lob it up and right into the heart of their fort, preferably on top of their heads. So there's two very different things that you want to use. A gun for taking out structures or anything that's line of sight, and you want to use a mortar to engage the enemy that's in defilade. I've been talking a lot. I'll be quiet for a second. I'm sorry. I got excited. Yeah, well, we've been excited about this whole thing, and we should be, because it's really dang interesting. So going all the way back, though, to your remark about this is the moment at which it changed. Yeah. I think there's some hidden truth in there that you might be missing. The moment you're referring to, when cannon fire became so effective that it changed fortifications is somewhere between the Napoleonic age and the American civil war, early 19th century to mid to late 19th century. That's really when these guns took over the battlefield in this way. And so then of course, because of what you were just saying about filet of fish or whatever it's called, people went underground in the early 20th century. And that's why trench warfare is the thing in world war one. It's this horrible moment where technology is advanced to this sickening stalemate where the worst kind of gruesome fighting ever would happen. And and it's like warfare was just begging for the next advancement so we could do it neater than what it had been. And then after that, well, planes. That window of time where the old medieval concept of fortification was really truly exposed by finely tuned big guns before everything changed because of aviation is actually a pretty small window of time. So because technology advanced so quickly in there, it's almost like we skipped four or five generations of offensive and defensive siege engineering 
because we scrambled it so quickly once we figured out how to break defenses easily. Does that make sense? What do you mean? What, what generations did we skip? Well, I mean, like the centuries that should have happened of cat and mouse between, okay, now you've got guns like that. Well, still, the only thing I have to fear here is a ground assault. That's the only thing that could ultimately truly ruin us inside our fortifications. So all I have to do is figure out how to counter your big guns, and I can do that. So we see the beginnings of castles with big guns to fire back at the other big guns. Okay, well, we'll just try to hit you back with artillery here from inside. We'll stockpile gunpowder and, and shot and see if it works. We'll create fortresses that funnel people to a certain place. And, uh-oh, there's a cannon right there that only we can shoot out of. So we see those developments starting to occur. But I feel like we don't get the centuries of play where big guns versus castles really plays out. That era came and went very quickly compared to the other eras of the cat and mouse because aviation came along and changed everything. True. It was just a tiny window of time that you're talking about here when everything changed. That's my point. Talk to me about what you found about battering rams. Battering rams are pretty straightforward, literally. So you get this mass <laughs> yeah, swinging. You said it in there. You go straight up to the gate and you start swinging this thing. And you start trying to hit stuff, but... I didn't know this, but the real innovation on battering rams is they made roofs that go on top of them. Yeah. So, yeah. So when people are trying to drop rocks on your head, it just hits the roof and, and goes off to the side. So battering rams. Is it historically accurate that some of those you know, containers that they put battering rams in would also have some kind of bracket system along the top, along the roof that they could tie the ram to and like swing it on ropes or something? so that it wasn't just all manpower, that was a thing. Yeah, that was a thing. Like, you just want all the force that you're imparting to the ram, you want it to be axially in the direction of momentum, right? So, yeah, they, they would swing those things back and forth, kind of like a Newton's cradle, but all the ball bearings are glued together kind of thing. Seems like it would be way easier to coordinate the strike if you had that big, long swing to time it with, really get into a rhythm as a team of batterers, rammers. Boy, I don't like the way either of those sound. No, I don't either. Whatever you want to call them. Uh, attackers. The strong dudes. <laughs> strong dudes, yeah. The the whackers. Oh, I keep not coming. I really need to work on this. We'll think of a name for them. <laughs> One of the things that it looks to me like is a myth about the defensive side of dealing with, say, uh, rammers is the whole boiling oil thing. Oil's really expensive. What? Why would you not just go with boiling water? Dude, people use crazy stuff with fire. For example, at the siege in Malta, they started running out of stuff, right? And so they would get, this is what I heard on that podcast, they would get like the hoops that go around barrels. That comes up again, okay. Yeah, they would dip them in, I guess it was tallow or some, some kind of flammable thing like paraffin or whatever. So probably pitch. And so they would dip them over and over, kind of like you would dip a candle. Okay. And then they'd light them on fire and roll them at people. They were fire hoops. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, you know what I would do if somebody rolled that at me? What? I'd just move out of the way real quick. <laughs> but still, I mean, it's flaming things rolling at you. I don't know. That yeah, sounds Hollywood to me. I don't know. Like If you're to a place where that's your strategy, things have gone poorly in your yeah. siege defense. The fire hoop. I'm Googling it. You know what? Uh, it's just a bunch of girls dancing with fire hoops. <laughs> <laughs> that just, was a regret. Just let it roll. Just let it roll. Regrettable <laughs> Google. I apologize. You know what? Uh, you know what Leonardo and the Ninja Turtles would do if they had barrel hoops? What? Rather than using their, uh, say, giant sword to stab a bad guy, they would throw the hoop around them like a frisbee so that it would make them you know, unable to move their arms and bumble around, and then they'd roll marbles out so it would make a googly sound, and then they'd fall down, and then the Ninja Turtles would call the authorities to have the ninjas arrested. Yeah, even though you carry swords to cut you people in half. You carry <laughs> a freaking sword, dude! Stab them with your sigh in the eyeball, Raphael. That what is are a you doing? magnificent idea. Hit someone <laughs> with a nunchuck. They're incredibly effective. I own a pair. Like The only thing Leonardo ever cut with the stupid sword was like pizza... pizza. Or ropes connected to chandeliers that would fall down and, again, cause Rocksteady and Bebop to be entangled. That drove me crazy. Yeah, same here. Rant over. So what I understand from one siege is that hot wax and water 
is what they poured out because they had a spring inside. So they had an unlimited, you know, ability to boil water. And apparently boiling water super hurts when it gets dumped on you from above. But it seems like you would run out of wood to make fire after a while. I mean, you just have a big stack of wood, I guess. Yeah. Something to think of. This makes me want to go stack bags of rice in the corner and just like a lot of sterno cans or something. That's not the worst idea ever. But (laughs) for me, the fun thing about these sieges when you get into crazy stuff like we built this cover for our battering ram and, well, we're going to use wax because that'll sneak through the... like. It's so cat and mouse game-ish, and it's so necessity is the mother of invention-ish. We just got to launch something here. What do we have? You got some cows or something? Let's try that. Those are heavy. I just <laughs> what? Literally, it's all dignity is set aside. Those people are inside those walls, and we need to be inside those walls. Give me all your brain power. Get me inside there. It's just amazing the creativity, horrifying, gruesome, grotesque creativity that came out of this stuff. <laughs> Okay, speaking of razor-sharp things that will probably never be used by a giant mutant turtle-human hybrid to stab a masked ninja, you met some guy who makes awesome knives? Yeah, there was this guy named Patrick who contacted me, and he was pretty clever with how he did it, if I'm honest. He just sent my wife a knife. (laughs) Like, not in a creepy way, but in like a, I made an awesome knife, and she might like this in the kitchen way? A handmade knife. It's called a chef's knife. And so she opens it, and I said, hey, this came in the mail uh, to the P.O. box. Check it out. And she opens it. She goes, oh, a chef's knife. And she pulled it out, and she knew, like, exactly what it was and how to use it and stuff. And I was like, what? It's, it just looks like a really pretty knife. She goes, oh, no, look at the shape of this blade. And she goes into it, and she told me absolutely everything about it. So, I mean, it's, it's a thing. Apparently, a chef's knife is a thing. And so this guy, his name is Patrick. He has this company called MT Knives, which is just mtknives.net and he makes knives and I met with him and he's really good at sharpening knives and all this stuff it's really interesting so we're going to shout out MT Knives and I asked him if he would put a promo code on his website and he said yes what do you think about that so like just to be straight up like you just met this guy he's cool he's good at what he does and you just think it's awesome so you're mentioning it right now Yeah, that's pretty much how this is working. Good. He sent me an email and it said like, hey, we'll get an affiliate link plugin set up or something like that. But I don't know. Yeah, sweet. There's this one knife called the Genesis 2. It comes with this Kydex little holster thing. It's a sheath and it hangs around your neck and you can just pop it out. And it's a really cool little knife. So if you want one, go to mtknives.net and use the coupon code NDQ at checkout. I don't know if that coupon code exists or whatever. Let me talk to him, see if it can exist. It'd be nice to give people a discount if we can. Yeah. I don't know how this works, but they're pretty cool knives. Go check them out. Cool. Just a guy making a making a living making knives. <laughs> Artillery's still a thing. Like, Well, yeah. The one thing I want to bring up is you talk about cannons on the battlefield. There's two different types of cannons, right? We talked about mortars, you know. There's field artillery, things you would drag around on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Or there's siege artillery. Now, siege artillery is where you get ticked off like Alexander the Great. You're mad at this car in front of you for not moving, a castle in front of you, whatever. And then you build the biggest freaking cannon you can imagine, and you just roll it up, and you're like, it's party time. We went, and we smelted iron, and we used the Bessemer process, and we made steel, and we figured out a way to make this thing explode when it got on your head, and we're going to fire it at you now. And nobody beat the Germans at that. (laughs) The Germans are the best at that. They visited the dwarves of Nazandruil. I don't know what they call it, but it's the dwarf planet where they forge the most powerful of weapons. You've heard of the Paris gun. Uh, Yeah, I think maybe I've just heard you talk about that. What's Paris gun? Dude, man. So the Germans, let's don't say the Germans. Let's say the Nazis, because in my head, I separate the two. You should. Yeah, the Nazis... They created this amazing gun. It's called, well, the second one was called Dora. Just right now, Google it. Okay, that I've heard of. Imagine a gun so big you have to make a dual railroad track to take it anywhere you want it to go. So it's like, hmm, I want to take this gun to that location. Guess I should build a railroad all the way across my country to take it there because I want it to show up at Stalingrad or wherever you want to take it, right? Sweet mercy. 
Are you looking at the picture? That thing is ridiculous. I stood next to one of the rounds that was fired from that thing. Not one that had actually been fired, but one that would be fired. And it was a rifled gun. This barrel was gigantic. Look, you can see in the picture, there's like however many people standing on the barrel on this thing. That's in, the- in the picture I've got, there are these two tiny little things that apparently are humans standing underneath it. Yeah. That is obscene. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So this thing could shoot... Oh, we got to find some stats on this. I mean, this was unbelievable. It's called the Schwerer Gustav. It's an 80-centimeter railway gun. 31-inch gun, dude. I know. <laughs> Diameter. <laughs> Diameter. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Like somebody said... That would said, hurt so bad. You know what we need to do? We need to make the biggest gun imaginable and... Don't even worry about it blowing up on us when we try to... Somebody had to fire this thing for the first time. That's what's incredible to me. Anyway, so this thing, it was such a big deal because when you fire a rifled projectile down the barrel, you're interfacing metal on metal. There's this thing called the obturator, which is what creates the gas seal of the projectile to the barrel. And so when this thing fired down the barrel, it would take a measurable amount of metal out from the inside of the barrel because it was scratching all the ways it went Every down. time. Yeah. It's amazing. And so the logistics of employing something like this is just absolute insanity. You used the word there that we haven't touched on yet. What? Logistics. Oh, dude. We danced around it earlier. I don't want to get too far ahead of you. Do you have, do you have other siege weapons that you need to talk about? No, I'm just really excited about all the, the math that goes into this stuff. I'll say this last thing. Please. I interacted with this older gentleman in Germany, and his father or grandfather, I don't know who, had worked a long, long time ago in like World War I uh, German artillery days. And he said back then they were firing so far on their ballistics tables, they had found some, and they were taking into account the rotation of the earth in their calculations as they fired from rail cars. I wonder how long it took them to figure out why they were missing before they thought, well, have we considered the rotation of the Earth? I don't know, but they figured that out, and they did that math. This is pre-calculators, all kinds of stuff. Clearly. I mean, it's fascinating. So anyway, I'm done. I could go for hours. No, no, you don't have to be done. Let's Let's just interact with the next part here. Let's do it. So here's what's interesting about all of this discussion about this gun does that, this ballista does that, this weapon does that. Well, we'll counter it with this. All of this conversation, and still, most sieges were not resolved with necessarily a full, bloody, violent outcome. Most sieges were just a camping contest. Yep. It's really simple. Okay, there's a program that we watch that involves things that are medieval-ish. I don't want to spoil anything from it, so I'm not even going to say what program it is. But there is a castle in a very strategic water location that a crusty old fighter doesn't want to give up. And he's willing to fight to the very end, but the other people are sick of being sieged. And so they're kind of like, look, fine, deal, here, whatever. And that so often is what is what happens. At the siege of Antioch, one of the leaders of the crusader forces somehow got into communication with the keeper of one of the gates, one of the towers of the city walls outside the keep that they were trying to take. And he just brokered a deal with this guy. The guy let him in. And that's how they breached the city walls of Antioch. Diplomacy? Well, diplomacy or, I mean, what do you call that? Conspiracy? (laughs) Yeah. Getting somebody to sell out everyone else. But war is psychology, man. I mean, it's engineering and it's psychology. And if the engineering is good then our brains know to be afraid or our brains become affected by what's happening around us and fear makes people do all kinds of weird things. So often these these sieges are about patience. They're about psychologically defeating your enemy. They're about trying to create a sense of hopelessness. They're about intimidation. And frankly, they're as much about disease as they are about actual shots fired or swords swung. I don't have the numbers on it, you know, from all of history, but the battles I've looked at, 
usually tilts in favor of the majority of casualties being inflicted through disease and starvation, not actual weapons. I saw the word dysentery come up a lot. What What is dysentery? Yeah. Okay, isn't dysentery the one that is like the kind of diarrhea that just rips you up so bad? Like, isn't that a poop-borne disease? I don't know. I got it all the time in Oregon Trail. <laughs> I kept getting yellow fever. I think the time that I really actually put thought into what dysentery is and, and how it works was in looking at like some of the slums of the late 19th century in some major cities. Maybe I'm thinking of two different things. I feel like there's a dysentery and a cholera epidemic. But these things were commonplace and they would set in before things like nutrient deprivation or scurvy or whatever. And um, I tell my kids, you know, as they help me maintain my cool little Dagobah aquarium in my office, that death is contagious. If something's dead in there, we need to get it out. You're talking about the fish? Yeah, I'm talking about the fish. I don't want to leave dead fish in a contained, enclosed environment with living fish. Like It's very sad. You're dead, but you need to go to the toilet now. And that'll be that. And the same thing in these in these cities. I, eventually, where do you put bodies, you know? You could bury them or... Burn them. Bring out your dead. Exactly that. Or, honestly, it costs nothing but a few cranks on your, on your catapult... To just send oh. your dead into your neighbor's camp. Yeah, you can let them deal with it. Yep. Don't mm. want them in the city. So all of these stories about launching dead bodies at each other, like the orcs do that at the Battle of Minas Tirith. They throw a bunch of heads in, and so guys are like, oh, my comrade's head just hit me. Gross. I'm very scared. Like, Well, there's a giant demon dragon that's going to come and throw you off a cliff. Be scared of that. So, so, yeah, I guess there's the intimidation factor, but more so, I think all of these stories are about out camping your enemy. It's really hard for us to have a successful camping trip when there are all these dead bodies around. So we just need to launch those dead bodies out of our camp so we can camp better. So you see that stuff. But how much have you read about Vikings and what they did and what were in what they were into? Almost nothing. Okay, what's your impression as layperson to that part of history then? They would show up in boats, okay? There'd be a village of peaceful people usually singing and playing harps. <laughs> yes. And they would roll up in there, and they all had hats on with horns on them. Yes, every time. And they wore fur, and then they would kill everybody. And then afterwards, they would have a big meal, and the way they would address each other is by pointing large legs of meat at each other. I actually feel like I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> you have just accurately described the entire history of Viking culture. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> and then there's Valhalla. So I, I did re listen to something that talked about Valhalla. So the idea was there's the Valkyries and Valhalla. Uh -huh. And so Valhalla was the place that in Viking lore, a warrior that had died in battle had the opportunity to go to, but everybody didn't go. And that's kind of a misconception that we have today because it were these Valkyries, which were these female spirits that would roam the battlefield and they would select who got to go to Valhalla and these people would go to Valhalla and then when they were there, there's this imagery that had to do with regeneration. So if uh, if you were at Valhalla, that's the place where, is it Odin, the god of war? The Norse god of war? Not the god of war. Odin, or in Germany, Woden, is just the uh, cantankerous, somewhat mischievous chief god, the all-father of Norse mythology. I think Valhalla, which is the largest gathering place of these warriors, I think Odin is supposed to be in charge. And, oh my gosh, I'm sorry if I'm butchering this for any of you uh, Vikings out there. But my understanding is they have this big party every night, and they're training for battle. And there's this picture of regeneration. Like, they go train for battle, and sometimes they die in this training, and then they would regenerate that evening in this big party in Valhalla, and they would eat the same boiled pork every night that somehow regenerates as well. I'm, re I'm regurgitating something I heard a professor from the UK who wrote a lot about that. I heard her on a podcast. So remember, to... remember the other day when you were like, do you know anything about Locke and Demosthenes? And yeah. I was like, I know a couple things. And then I said it, and then you were like, that was a few things, man. It's like that, yeah. except I asked you what you know about Vikings, and you were like, oh, shucks, nothing. I am but a simple Alabaman rocket scientist. And then you said a whole bunch of stuff that's accurate. I literally regurgitated. Regurgitation is still knowledge. <laughs> okay. It counts. 
Most of what you know is probably regurgitation. Was all that right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and Norse mythology, like most mythologies, is a bit of a moving target. But generally speaking, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm audiobooking, I still don't know how to say his name, Neil Gaiman or Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology, Norse gods. I think it's Norse mythology. And he takes all the different variants and tells the story. So I'm having fun hanging out in that world right now on audiobook. But the Vikings had a really interesting economic approach. And that was just let other people do the work and then take their stuff. What do you mean? The Vikings had no interest or very little interest in conquest. What they were excellent at was raiding. And in the late first millennium, we hear stories about the Vikings raiding all the way into like Kiev and deep into Eastern Europe and maybe even trading with people as far away as like modern day Iraq and Iran. Wait a second. E Eastern Europe, like over land? I thought they were just like Scandinavian. Yeah, but rivers like the Rhine and the Rhone are deep water rivers. Really? You can sail clear in the Seine that flows through Paris provided similar access by the time they decided they wanted to try that in the ninth century. So the Vikings, the Vikings are like the Iron Islands in Game of Thrones. Yeah. We do not sow. You know, that's the, the house words of House Greyjoy or whatever it is. Uh-huh. We do not sow. The Vikings do not sow. I mean, they did actually a little bit, but it's fun to imagine they didn't at all. So they finally are emboldened after the death of Charlemagne. You've heard of that guy. Yep. He's the super tall dude who was Holy Roman Emperor in the early ninth century. Charlemagne establishes this empire that encompasses modern day France, Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, like the whole middle of Europe, right? And he tries to just create this dynasty, but his grandkids, there are too many of them. And so the whole thing gets divided up amongst the grandkids and some of them are more competent than others. And the descendants of Charlemagne who end up in charge of what we now call France just weren't always that great. And there's this guy named Charles the Fat who is in charge of, well, Paris like and a, party. other places. Oh, hardcore, dude. <laughs> Tell you what he can't do. <laughs> Defeat Run. Vikings. Were you oh. just boots and cats -ing? Was <laughs> that, that, was, that was a little different. Boots and cats. Boots and cats, okay. boots and cats. It was really good. I hear that all the time now. <laughs> <laughs> so the Vikings are like, ah, there's no more Charlemagne. Come on. I, these grandkids of his, these great grandkids of his are a joke. Let's go for the good stuff. And so they decide to attack Paris, which is one of the jewels of Western Europe, right? But Paris is set up brilliantly. The majority of the town is situated on this island in the middle of the Seine, and it has only two bridges that access it. And each of those bridges, one running out to the left bank, one running out to the right bank of the river, have two towers on them. They're big and heavily fortified. And the bridges sit super low to the water so nobody can pass underneath them. So it's like, you know, the place that had the chains in Germany. Or the twins, again, in Game of Thrones. I'm sorry for anybody who doesn't watch that, but it's, you know, you know, the twins dominate whatever river that is, and so the phrase yep. get to determine who comes and goes. That's what Paris was. Paris was the twins. And so these Vikings come along. Uh, I feel like the guy's name was Siegfried. I don't know, maybe I'm thinking of the people who work with the tiger in Vegas. I think it's Siegfried. He comes along and he's like, hey, pay us a whole bunch of money. We're Vikings and we kill everybody. And if you pay us a whole bunch of money, we won't destroy your city. And the Parisians are like, have you seen our city? Sucker, bring it. And so the Vikings are like, oh, oh, we will. And so the Vikings decide to try to destroy one of those two bridges, but the bridges are too well built and they can't really be burned, and the bridges sustain the attacks. So the Vikings try different approaches to getting onto these bridges, which really are literally the only two points of access. The walls of the city and fortifications go straight up all the way around the island. There's just no way to land or to attack. In Paris it. they do? Yeah, well, they did then. Okay. Uh, I don't know how it is now. The Vikings have to try to take one of these two bridges. And remember I told you earlier that there was an incident where fortifications actually went up overnight yeah well this siege i think was in 885 and overnight the parisians added an extra story to one of their towers and so the vikings are like well maybe tomorrow we could get up there and oh what the heck is that way taller and it provided increased range for the archers wow. on the parisian side 
So then what happens is the Vikings are like, all right, all right, all right, all right. There's got to be another way to do this. Okay, you guys wait there. You're still under siege. We're going to go pillage a little bit. So they would go off into the countryside and pillage and stuff. And the Parisians still really couldn't afford to expand. So again, it wasn't really a closed loop because the Parisians could send for help and so forth. And they asked Charles the Fat to come help. He's working on it. He's fat. He's getting there. The Vikings come back and they're like, all right, now you guys are done for. We got a strategy. And so they fill the river with all this debris and junk from the destroyed settlements on either bank, all the bodies of the dead, and they just fill the river. And Is it floaty stuff or just stinky stuff? Yeah, floaty stuff. Okay. And the idea is we're just going to jam up the river so much that we could just even like walk across it on like bodies and sticks and stuff. Whoa. And so it'll create a dam, put pressure with the water flow on the bridge and destroy it. But it doesn't work. The bridges are too well built. Eventually, it's natural causes, it's heavy rains and flooding that wash out one of the bridges, as I picture it, on the right bank. And so when that bridge finally goes, there are only 12 dudes in the tower on the bank side of the bridge, only 12 French defenders. And the Vikings are like, come out. And they're like, yeah, I don't think so. And so they fight to the death and all of them get killed. And then ultimately the Vikings are able to take the city or about to just as Charles the Fat shows up. And Charles the Fat is like, oh, we should fight them. And then he's like, uh, let's just pay them. So he gives them 700 pounds, like, like not a currency, like pounds of silver to just leave him alone, please. How do you think that made the people who just endured this siege that went on for months and months feel? Not cool. Not cool. You mean if you were just going to pay 700 pounds of silver to these people to go away, you couldn't have just showed up here, I don't know, a couple months ago and just paid them? or sent a check, or something? What are you doing? And so that siege at Paris in, I think, 885, and the resolution between Charles the Fat and Siegfried with checkbook diplomacy is one of the things that really effectively kills the Carolingian dynasty. That is the dynasty descended from Charlemagne and other contenders for French and Holy Roman Empire power come to play. So my point in all of that is, one, it's a pretty interesting story because People tried to fill a river with bodies for fun. Yeah, that's a good story. But my point is, these sieges are so pivotal because the psychology behind them is deeply bitter. Like, you will never forget the time the Vikings came and camped outside your town for the better part of a year and then slaughtered almost everyone you know or care about. And then your stupid king showed up and just wrote him a check to go away instead of actually fighting with them. Changed an empire. So have you heard of the Polish Hussars? Yes, but I don't know much about them. All you need to know is I'm about to share a music video with you that's going to change your life. Oh, I like those. There is a metal band called Sabaton. Uh, okay. And apparently this is a huge thing for Polish national pride. There was this battle back in, uh, I don't know, I'm looking, between the 16th and 18th century, I don't know... I don't know. I'm That's trying a wide to wiki range. It. I'm trying to wiki it really hard. Long story short, there was a battle that happened, and this one dude had this group of people. They called the Winged Hussars, and it's this cavalry regiment, and they had these wings that they would wear, and this dude showed up at the last minute, and they were just awesome. They were like the special forces of the special forces, and they would just show up at the last minute in this one pivotal battle in Europe, and they basically saved Europe because the winged hussars showed up when nobody else would. But you really need to watch this music video. It's called Sabaton, the Winged Hussars. Do you need me to watch it right now? I do. I, I'm sorry, okay. I do. I'll watch that yeah. right now. I don't know what that pivotal battle is as I pull this up. All I know is that they're light cavalry. They're light cavalry? Yeah, it's a light cavalry. I said cavalry. You did say cavalry. Cavalry is the hill where Jesus died. <laughs> that bothers you, doesn't it? <laughs> cavalry. <laughs> I'm so yeah, sorry. If, if, and if you know what? If you ever have trouble remembering it, you can Don't just remember do it. that Don't do a it. cavalier would be someone who participates in the work of the cavalry. Just like if you can't keep straight nuclear and nuclear, you can just remember nucleus and it'll <laughs> always straighten itself out. See? 
I have tricks that I use to keep myself from saying things I didn't mean to say. Okay, got it? Watch it. This is freaking awesome. Yes. So this was the siege of Vienna. Like, this was the deciding battle that was going to determine if the Ottoman Empire came into Europe and just started going crazy because they were encroaching into Europe like crazy. That's the high watermark of Islam in Europe. Like, like military Islam, not current events. Yeah, so they got to Vienna... And the siege was going down, and it was looking bad. And then the winged hussars arrived. (laughs) (laughs) You know what, though, man? Like, you look closely at these accounts of these sieges and what was going on, and people, like, what a helpless feeling. I'm stuck inside these walls. I'm watching people die. The old people and the babies, they're going to go first. And it's just this sense of inevitability. The siege of Antioch? Like, there was help coming from Constantinople, and the dude turned around and left. Do you know the problem? What? The winged hussars didn't <laughs> arrive. <laughs> That's exactly what didn't happen. Yeah, but have I you, mean... Have so, you okay. read about... I, I encourage you, anybody reading this, just stop what you're doing and read the Wikipedia page about the Battle of Vienna and then go watch the YouTube video by Sabaton, yes. winged hussars. It is like how In do you feel that having order? Having just watched that music video, what are you feeling? The well timed military bailout in old school warfare is one of the most moving things to me. Like little girls running and then that. <laughs> it's crazy. Back to the Lord of the Rings, right? You remember when they're attacking Minas Tirith, uh, Rohan shows up for one last ride. The riders of Rohan, who in the past were famed for their courage and bravery, but who had fallen on hard times and hadn't factored into the fight forever. And then Theoden comes back to life and he rides up and down the lines and he doesn't make any claims about let's go and reclaim our glory. It's one last ride, you know, one last time into the breach. It's just this like suicide run for what's good and what's right and you know, things in the real world aren't nearly as cut and dried as fighting against evil fanged mud monsters in Lord of the Rings. But man, that kind of thing is moving to me. And that silly little music video with ridiculous rock music over the top what shouldn't have ridiculous? been emotionally effective, but that was effective. Yeah, it is. Okay, let me let me just read some of this, okay? So, as the days are passing by and the dead are piling high, this is talking about the Siege of Vienna, no escape and no salvation. Trenches to explosive halls are buried deep within the walls. Plant the charges there and watch the city fear. Desperation, desperation. It's a desperate race against the mine and a race against time. And would you like to say it? And the wind <laughs> <wind has arrived. laughs> arrived. <laughs> is it not? I mean, like, I'm not even Polish and this is this is pumping me up, man. Yeah. Anyway, I saw this months ago, and I've been waiting to share it with you, and I forgot that this had to do with the Siege of Vienna until right now. Oh, your timing is absolutely impeccable. It would have been stupid if you'd brought it up sooner. Nice job. Isn't that cool, though? Anyway, that's just a... And and what I would encourage you to do is you can watch that music video, which is one of the most amazing music videos I've ever seen. It's like actual guys on horseback going... I don't know how they film that without Don't describe it. We already sold it. Let them go watch it. Okay, cool. Yeah, you're going to wreck it. Just... Let them go watch it. Go watch that, and then go find a Sabaton music concert. <laughs> Just Oh, man. did people get into that part? Dude, Google Sabaton Live Winged Hussars. It's got to be in Poland, though. Like, it's got to be in Poland. So you remember how we did that skit in the Antikythera episode? And I wanted to redo it, but it didn't really work here in this episode, right? Because we had too much going on. Yeah, it escapes me. I barely remember it. (laughs) I'm sure. So here's what I want to do. We always thank the patrons, like every single time, because they really 
make this happen in a big way, like a very personal way. So I just taught you about the song by Sabaton, The Wing Hussars. Yes. Here's what I would like to do, Matt. You have okay. before you a list of patrons. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. People have listened to the music, and if you don't know, this is what the background guitar riff goes like. So here's how we're going to do this, Matt. Would you agree that the patrons are really our heroes? Would you agree with that? <laughs> yes, I would. And I'm <laughs> excited to see where this is going. I'll allow it. I'm going to uh, chant out some of the lyrics like I'm singing the song. And then instead of then the wing hussars arrived, what oh, I want you to do is pick a patron name and then you just filled it in. Oh, I'm ready. Yeah, you don't need my agreement. My agreement is implicit. Continue. So you have the one you're going to sing? Yes, I do. Dedication, dedication, they're outnumbered 15 to 1, and the battle's begun, and Andy Katana connected. I can't say his name like that, it doesn't fit the rhythm. You're trying and to say Andy Katana, and Andy Katana, it doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? And, and okay, then, tr- tr- try me, try me. Desperation, desperation, it's a desperate race against the mine. And a race against time. And Eric R. arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric R., for being a patron. <laughs> I strongly agree. One more, one more, okay? One more? Yeah, no, at least. Okay, okay, so you got to just pick a name with mm-hmm. three syllables total, mm-hmm. right? Dedication, dedication, they're outnumbered 15 to 1. And the battle's begun. And Tara Sims arrived. <laughs> Sarah Sims? Yeah, she arrived right then. Sarah Sims, we were on the ropes. We were outnumbered 15 to 1. Approximately. You, you arrived and you saved us as a patron. Thank you so much. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> I don't know, man, but it's it's going to work. People are going to get it. <laughs> I don't understand why we do the things we do. <laughs> it's because we feed our kids, man. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm for. Which I'm for. <laughs> Dedication, dedication, there are numbered 15 to 1, and the battle's begun, and Eddie and Katana, Katana arrived. arrived. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best thing ever. It's not. <sighs> Give me one more. Desperation, desperation, it's a desperate race against the mine, and a race against time. And then <laughs> who's only pledged one dollar and his card was declined, arrived. <laughs> <laughs> I just tried my dad. <laughs> Good. If nothing else happens, I've introduced you to the winged hussars, my friend. That's all I needed. I'm good. Oh, golly. God. Uh, uh, pa- Patreon.com <laughs> slash no dumb questions. Thank I'm you so very sweaty. much. <laughs> I pitted out my shirt. I smell like cabbage. <laughs> the more Western you get, the less this applies. But what would you say is the biggest shared sense of pride? that any person you could walk up to in your state would have. State pride. State pride? Yeah. We have a pretty checkered history here in Alabama, and so now, recently, it's it's football, right? It's football. Yeah, it is. It's football. And what is football? Football is, I don't know, it's a, it's almost like nationalism here, but it's, yes. it's statehood. Football is just war where you don't kill people. With tight, measurable rules so you know who won. Oh, wow. It is, isn't it? You got infantry. You got light cavalry. You got heavy cavalry. You have artillery, airstrikes. You have defenses. It's just war. 
All football does is replace campaign season that was a part of human history and masculinity for the infinite number of thousands of years prior to football. Soccer, in a way, accomplishes the same thing. We're just not into it as much here because, for whatever reason, football is a better fit culturally for Americans. Sport is trying to take the place of what campaign season was back in the day. And what comes with winning at football? You, better than anyone other than a New England Patriots fan, should be able to say bragging rights. Yeah. It is a source of state pride. My little girl took the clothes that your little girl outgrew. And she's been wearing them around everywhere we go. Roll Tide, Roll Tide, this, really? Vermont, New Hampshire, Israel. Roll Tide. Like, not in Israel. That did not Israel, happen. Israel. We got a Roll Tide at the Dead Sea. One in Jerusalem. Whoa. We got a Roll Tide at Caesarea. Wow. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I mean, who cares? It's just, it's a stupid ball and you throw it around and you wear pads so you don't even get hurt. Like, it's a ridiculous game. But it is a source of identity. Even how teams play football usually matches with the psyche of the area. The Pittsburgh Steelers are going to roll up their sleeves and it's not going to be pretty and they are going to grind it out. Good defensive team, hard workers. They draft the same kind of players on purpose again and again because that team has a brand that matches Western Pennsylvania. I mean, the Vikings, for crying out loud, the people who settled in Minnesota were Vikings. So they picked a mascot that fits with what they're into. The John Elway, Peyton Manning, Denver Broncos cut loose Wild West thing. The Broncos play football like we in the West, in the Mountain West, think of ourselves. I get it, Matt. You like football. I get it. No, <laughs> but you see where this is going. So yeah, I do. before football... What would your bragging rights be about? I mean, what could make a whole crowd of people go crazy with a shared sense of pride? This is a part of us. We have ownership of this. Hey, you remember that time we lost that war? <laughs> yeah, remember all those Polak jokes that we endure? Yeah, well, we saved Europe, too. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, that. I mean, for Poland, that's huge. It really is. I mean, I mean, you can tell by reading reading about it and reading in the comments section. I mean, it's pretty cool. Well, go Poland. Yeah. If you like Europe and you like the idea of the West, thank you, Poland. Yeah. Like, hats off. Because the wing hussars are right. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just think Isn't it's it so, like as a historian, that makes my heart swell with happiness because that's a, a whole set of generations, hundreds of years after the fact, who have not forgotten and still have a sense of pride over what happened there, even though they didn't have anything to do with it. It's just a part of their story. So that's why sieges are so important, because there are specific moments when some kind of cultural, political issue comes to a head. It's like a zit that's ready to pop, and that yes. is the moment in time when it has to happen, and you have to see what happens there. Sieges are important, and how you go about handling the siege is also important. Yeah, the way Hitler prosecuted the siege of Stalingrad is the second worst thing he ever did. And then you look at other sieges where vows were kept. Hey, if you will just put an end to this and open your gates, everyone will be spared. And then everybody was spared. The fallout on the backside of how you prosecute a siege, I mean, it's an ugly reality if you get to that point. But how you handle it in that darkest moment really does seem to set a course for how both of those groups, the victors and the defeated, you know, what their future looks like and what relations in an area looks like. But you're right about that, that zit analogy. I mean, how crazy does stuff have to get for you to rally 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 of your best friends to go and basically live like you're at a rock festival, but with the intent of killing all the people who are at a rock festival on the other side of those walls? Yeah. And not just like men, like just anybody who's here, whoever just happened to be here right now, total you're all war. in. We're going to starve you. Total war. Crap has had to have gone to crazyville to get to this point. I think you can trace like the shape of the earth in terms of the political lines that have been drawn from siege to siege. Yes. Throughout history. Because that's the moment where we have this bulkhead that happens and everything swells up and, and it's gonna the seesaw is going to tip one way or the other. And when it does, 
that is now the type of government we have in that location. And those are the people that are in power. And they're going to do things for the next hundred years in a very different way. And so I think you can trace history, all of human history. It's like connect the dots, and the dots are different sieges and different battles and things like that. I mean, yeah, uh, that's that's my impression. I mean, you can look at all of the battle in France in World War II as like one big siege. And so yeah, I don't know. Well, and and to support what you just said, you threw out the example of the siege of Vienna. Obviously, if that goes the other way, things look a lot different. The Mongols laid siege to probably the most advanced city in the world at the time. I think this was in the 13th century. No, it was a little later. It was Baghdad. They sieged Baghdad and they destroyed it and they took all the books, all the writing of the great Muslim renaissance that had happened. There was this this Islamic golden age that occurred around 1000 AD. They took all those books, everything, the equivalent of the Library of Alexandria, maybe more than the Library of Alexandria, books that included the classics of the West that are still lost because of this incident. And the Mongols, the great grandson or grandson of Genghis Khan, chucked them into the river and raised Babylon to the ground. What happens if that doesn't occur? Babylon survives that siege and the Crusades play out different. I can tell you that much. And we're living on Venus by now because we have new technology. Yes! <laughs> Dang it! Mongols! And the point here is the stupid Mongols. Not really. That's not really the point. But who knows? I mean, you're right. These are the choose-your-own-adventure moments in the book of history. And the reason I'm most interested in it is because the way they play out boils down to engineers. <laughs> And I'm so interested in it because the way it plays out boils down to humans and how humans think and how they respond in mass to threat and duress and how much those humans believe in their ideology demonstrates how long they're willing to hold out and dig in. This was fun, man. Good idea for no, this topic. Didn't care for it. No, I'd be cool if we just deleted this one. I yeah, I don't can't know. imagine just, anybody's even just... still listening. Let's just can this. I think it was a flaming disaster. This was fun. And the wing host stars arrived. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'll be driving home to. That cop's going to pull me over for noise violations. Cool, man. Uh, I'm going to shut it down because I'm sitting in my truck again in the middle of nowhere. And I'm going to go rejoin my family. Dun, 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 I Coming feel Polish pride. I'm not Polish, but I'm with <laughs> I them. I know, man. It's awesome. Yeah, this is fun, dude. Sweet. All right, talk to you soon. <laughs> <laughs>